Well, good evening, my friends. I'm Erica Lukes, and let me tell you, it has been a week. It's been a day, as a matter of fact, and things have been very uh, chaotic and tumultuous, but we are getting there, and tonight I know will be a very excellent interview. I'm really looking forward to talking to my guest, Mike Rogers. First of all, I want to just thank all of you out there who follow my work. I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I'm very passionate about what I do because I truly feel that there is something genuine to all of this. And I know, having gone through my own battles, that there are people that are taking certain events and they're manipulating them for their own gain. And that has hurt not only me, but people that I love. And so at the end of the day, it is my goal to try to empower each of us who has had a personal experience and then also expose people that, you know, might have ulterior motives. And you know me with my work with Skinwalker Ranch. It's been a lot of hard bumps along the way, but I'm still here. And I also want to say that in the, the up and coming months, I will be talking a little bit more about some of the things that I've learned with Skinwalker Ranch. Um, this has been a hard road for me, but I will definitely put information forward because you deserve to know, we all deserve to know, we've been conned and manipulated for far too long and this is going to end. So I am here tonight with my friend, Scott Brown. Scott, welcome to the show. How's it going, Erica? You know, it's going. I'm thinking, yes, 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 it's it's going. And right now we could not add uh, Mike Rogers to the show. And so I want with on the video, but we've got him here on audio. And so I want to just introduce Mike. And you can you hear me, Mike? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Okay. So Mike has been involved. He was involved in the one of the most important abduction cases of all time. And I know that all of you who are listening have no doubt heard about the Travis Walton case. Mike Rogers was involved in the case because he was Travis Walton's boss of the Timber Stand Improvement Crew in Snowflake, Arizona in 1975. This case has been, uh, you know, like I said, it's a landmark case. I have interacted with Travis um, at many conferences, and it has been interesting to watch him over the years. I actually reached out to him tonight just to see if he wanted to come on the show. I haven't heard back from him. I know he doesn't check Facebook, but um, hopefully I will hear back from him. But Mike has, I mean, Mike has a lot of experience. And Mike, first of all, hopefully you can hear me, but I want to ask yes, you, sure yes, it's a miracle. Praise <laughs> Lord Mary. <laughs> So, uh, Mike, first of all, please tell us about your background, because I know when we had talked before the show, you had mentioned that you had one granddaughter, and you were really proud of your granddaughter, and you also had, you know, other, uh, you know, had had a big family. So tell us about your family. Well, I have, uh, let's see, how many kids do I have? Let me count them. <laughs> My oldest daughter's name is Dawn. Uh, the next in line is Cher. The next in line is Michelle. And then Nicole. And then I have a, I had a son named Michael. Uh, okay. And then uh, finally, uh, another daughter named uh, Katie. Or I call her KK. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> since then I've had one more son. His name is uh, Heston. And uh, anyway, I think that's what seven. Wow. <laughs> I have uh, eight grandsons and one and only one granddaughter, and her name is Zoe. And how old is she? Uh, right now, as of yesterday, she was 10 years old. Oh, that is the best age because they're like still fun and they're not sassy. <laughs> right now on my uh, Facebook page, at the very top, there's a picture of Zelly uh, asleep at about 11 o'clock last night. She finally just fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she's a doll, you know. I think an awful lot of her. We had a great party, and the only interruption I had 
during the day, during during that day, is this guy named Ryan Gordon. Uh, I don't know how many people heard about him. Probably wouldn't. You shouldn't even talk about it. You know, actually, I shouldn't. So I won't. <laughs> Well, I, I, I know that there has been a bit of controversy with that, and I, I saw that there was a, a recorded interview and, and things, but I want to talk about that later because, first of all, I want to talk about you, and I want to talk about what your, what growing up, what your life was like, and then how things changed that fateful night back uh, when yeah. Travis Walton was abducted. Okay. Well, I was born in a little town called Snowflake, Arizona, okay? And uh, that was back in night. Uh, I was born on April 4th, 1947. So I'm 74 years old now. And I'm probably not going to live more than another 30, 40 years, you know? <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> my, my grandfather, Rogers, uh, you know, lived in 98 and uh, he uh, deliberately starved himself to death because he felt that he had just lived too long <laughs> and I don't understand that but that's true and, and my my uh, grandmother Rogers lived to be 94 and my grandmother Howard the other side of the family lived to be 93 and my grandfather Howard uh uh, he he died when he was uh, 64, I believe, of a strangulated hernia. That's not good. No, not good. Uh, I'm I have a little bit of trouble with balance since uh, uh, I was actually struck by lightning when I was in the top of the tall tree installing the lightning protection system. Uh, back uh, almost exactly 15 years ago and I was in the hospital from that for a, approximately a week and uh, my doctor at the time said that he and five other doctors concurred that there was nothing they could do for me and, and so they sent me home to die <laughs> and I, I heard that so I'll be damned, but I, I got really angry about that. So the very next day, I got up and went to work. And at the time, I had uh, two helpers, my girlfriend, Bernadette, and my son, Heston, okay? And uh, they were they were hard workers, but I just, I just went at it. I mean, I went at it. I did everything I could. I couldn't hardly see. I couldn't hardly walk. Uh, I could think pretty good. Uh, but my balance was gone, and I was, I was walking around on a cane and everything like that. Anyway, uh, to go back to the original part of the story we started with. <laughs> Let's see, 22 years of my life, and then I, I got married uh, to this girl named Katie Gillette who then became Katie Collette Rogers. <laughs> and uh, we had six children. And uh, later on, a few years later, I moved up to Lakeside, Arizona, and then Shoal, Arizona, and then Lakeside, Arizona, back and forth. One time I even moved to Heber, Arizona, uh, for a while. And uh, that, was, that was like the first 30 years of my life, 30-some 30, 30 years of my life. Anyway, all that time, I've, I've been doing artwork, you know, paintings and stuff like that. And uh, so it's uh, steadily grown. Right now, uh, I live in Lakeside, and I have a, I have a house, uh, a two-story. I'm on the second floor, put it that way, uh, where I am right at this moment. And I'm looking out east here. And we're starting to get some rain again. We had a hell of a rain yesterday. A little bit of one the day before yesterday. Anyway, uh, I've been working on a, on a Christ painting. Uh, they're nearly finished. Uh, it's a, it's a unique, I guess you'd say. It's a, it's a, Christ has got a tear in his eye. And he's got a beard and a mustache. And he's got wavy hair. 
and uh, a white flowing robe. Anyway, <laughs> uh, there's a, actually a, a picture of that before I, at one stage of, of de development on that painting, you, you can find that on my Facebook page down down the ways there. And and what what can you away. can you tell us what your What's Facebook that? can you tell us what your Facebook page is for everyone so oh, they can yeah. check it out? Well, you can you can get my Facebook page just by going to Mike Heston Rogers, M I K E H E S T O N R O G E R S slash Facebook forward slash. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and uh, there you will find uh, pretty much my whole life. I mean, uh, practically everything on there. I, I'm, some people say you're too open. Well, uh, I don't have any secrets, so that's the way I am. And, and so <laughs> let's... I wish, this, I wish this show could have been a, a live video. I know. Audio, you know? I know, I would, because I would love to see you. You know, I've watched you in videos before, yeah. and... That would be fun to to see you and interact that way. But we're here and we're we're doing it. And I I just yeah. you know I I want to go back to you know the the incident in Arizona because you were involved in something that pretty much changed yeah. the course of everyone's life. And so describe that particular. Well, it certainly changed my family's life and and see if my uh, at the time. Uh, at the time of the incident, Travis Walton worked for me, along with a number of other people. In fact, in the, in the truck, which was an international crew cab at the time, uh, there was there was me driving, uh, Ken Peterson in the in the middle, and Travis Walton on the outside uh, passenger seat. And in the back, there was four people. Uh, Alan Dallas, who has dead, been dead now for nine or 10 years, I think I heard he throw it a night of some drug overdose or something. Anyway, uh, right next to him it was uh, Steve Pierce, and then next to him, going you know back towards the away from the the door, the, the, the right side door, was uh, Al, uh, uh, the John Gillette, and then the back corner, uh, you know, the next door back was uh, 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 Dwayne Smith. Anyway, uh, yeah, we uh, we quit work that day right actually a little bit after sundown uh, because my contract was behind and we were trying to catch up. Uh, I always tried to do the best I could uh, and uh, you know, because this was a forest service contract, and I, I, I've done those kind of contracts, so, so many different ones over the years. In fact, I spent probably 35 years of my life doing uh, a timber stand improvement, uh, logging, uh, tree planting, uh, just all kinds of stuff. Brush piling with a cat, with, uh, you know, I even built a thinning machine, what I call a thinning machine. It would, it would, it would, it would cut up to nine inch diameter trees uh, and you know just leave a clean swath behind it. Anyway, uh, that night, I could say we, we uh, worked until after sunset and everybody loaded up. And of course I was the boss, so you know, uh, I didn't treat my guys like as if I was a boss. I always acted like I was a friend, their friend, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I later on, there was another competitor who said, why in the hell do you do that? So, well, I just don't feel that I should be back like a boss. You know? Right. I mean, I was only five years older than the next oldest guy. And, uh, you know, I was 28 at the time. Well, in fact, I was only three years older than Ken Peterson. Uh, and the, and the uh, youngest guy there, apparently with uh, Steve Pierce, but now the other day he told me that John Gallette was only 16 at the time. Oh. <laughs> I said, no, you know. Uh, 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 you know, Steve didn't tell me he was 17, and John Gallette didn't tell me anything. <laughs> so, I don't know. 
and, and how, <laughs> let me ask you, how long had you worked with each of these people? With these guys? Yes. I've seen my crew would change from time to time uh, over the years. And, and you know, at one point, I actually hired, uh, had uh, Travis Wallen's brother, Dwayne Wallen, working for me. That was like the year before I, I hired Travis. And that was nine years before the incident, which was in 1975. So if you have any ability for math, <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the story. You know, we were working that night, work, you know, after sunset, headed up that road. It was very steep at first, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know, we went like a quarter of a mile, something like that. Very slow up that hill. In fact, uh, I didn't have a four-wheel drive. That international crew cab was, was just a regular, but so it was kind of tough going up that hill. But once we got up a little where it wasn't quite so steep, things were a little better. But I had just I just put a new muffler on that thing because I was always knocking mufflers off. Anyway, we got up there to where there was a group of trees in the way. You know, uh, we couldn't see much. But before that, the guys were seeing uh, a little bit of light streaming through the trees, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of this because I was uh, keeping my eyes on this road because it was a very rough road. It had humps in it, you know. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> when we finally went around this uh, corner, you might say, uh, uh, we broke into a, an opening, a clearing. It wasn't a real big clearing. You know, it was just a break in the trees, but it was pretty dense around the size of it. And uh, Travis yells out, stop the truck. So I did. And uh, in fact, I couldn't see this thing, whatever it was at the time. I didn't know what they were looking at. So I put the emergency brake on and I turned the truck off. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and and everybody was just like dumbstruck, you know, just spellbound. I, uh, I had to lean over uh, to my right quite a bit in order to see up through the top of the cab. Uh, I mean, not through the top of the cab, but through the edge over by the, by the driver's side door. And Travis had left that door open. And uh, anyway, uh, he ran up there a ways, and, and I leaned over in time to see him, you know, walking up there. And he walked up in a kind of a, he went kind of to the right first and then up with, but you know, this, this was only like, uh, less than 100 feet from the from the edge of the truck. We actually made it this later, it, it, uh, 93 feet from the edge of the truck to the actual spot where Travis Walton was standing. Anyway, uh, once I leaned over, I could see him and I could see this object and I was very, very, uh, uh, it's hard to explain. I, I had never seen anything like that before in my life. Uh, I'd seen something, in fact, Travis and I had had an experience uh, with, with six, six people in the car. It was a Dodge Charger, and that was in 1970. And we, we were heading west out of Snowflake. Anyway, that was a, a turned out to be a, a large sphere. It was, uh, when we got up close to it, we weren't more than maybe 300 yards away. It was up in the clouds. It seemed to be making the, the clouds. And it was a, a, a sphere, like I say. I mean, you could see that clearly. And it was a very strange color. It was kind of orange on the outside and, and, uh, and purplish-like in the middle. I've, got, I've done an illustration of, of that, which you can, you can see on my page if you scroll down far enough. And uh, anyway, it, it turned the light on. There was a light that went on the bottom of that thing and shone down on the ground and lit up the whole area. Uh, my little sister yelled out from the back, you know, is it the end of the world? <laughs> My little sister, Joy. And uh, anyway, back to the story again. Travis Walton standing there under, under that UFO, whatever it was. And uh, he, he kept looking back uh, a couple of times and, they, and, he, he, and then he crouched down behind the uh, sort of underneath the log that was sticking out from this uh, brush pile. I call it a brush pile, but it was actually a, a pile of, of logs that the cats had pushed up 
because a year earlier they had actually logged the area. What we were doing was going through and piling and taking care of what was left. Uh, sometimes it involved large trees, sometimes small trees, but they just wanted to uh, spruce the area up and log what was left, uh, you know, cut down what was left and mm-hmm. pile it. Uh, so that's what we were doing. And, and I had three people on the st- on saws with Travis Walton, uh, Dwayne, uh, excuse me, Travis Walton, Alan Dallas, and, uh, and uh, John Gillette. <laughs> anyway, and the rest of the guys were pines, three guys pines, which was Kim Peterson, uh, Dwayne Smith, and Steve Pierce. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, Travis was standing there with his hands in his pocket. He crouched down. He, uh, he then stood up. And at that time, I didn't actually see what hit him, okay? I was, I had a lot of anticipation, anxiety building up. I I just knew something was gonna happen. So I turned away and and turned the truck back on, released the emergency brake. And when I, when I did, I was, I was looking forward out of the cabin. When when I did, the entire wood lit up a bluish green color and it was brighter than day. It really was. I mean, it was uh, amazing. And, and of course, my eyes shot right back there, and I saw him going through the air and lit, land on his back. And he, and he kind of bounced a little. The dust rolled up around him, you know. And uh, everybody in the truck was yelling for me, get the hell out of here, you know, leave. I mean, uh and so I did, and I hit the gas, you know, and, and I took off down that road, which was a very, very bad road with these uh, humps of dirt in it, you know, what they call thank you, man. The, the, the road was closed, put it that way. And we had to dig around those piles just to be able to get around. So when I was heading out of there, I was uh, not doing too well of a job of it because I was uh, just not knowing what was happening here. I just knew we had to hurry. Everybody was yelling at me. And so uh, at one point, I knocked one of the mirrors off the truck. Uh, I may have knocked both of them off. I don't remember. I'm certain they dropped, knocked the one off on my side. And uh, we went down the road about a quarter of a mile there very quickly. In fact, uh, a couple of times we, we hit the hump so hard that uh, the guys, you know, they went up out of their seat. Like, you know, I don't know if they hit their head or not, but we certainly, you know, it was a, certainly a jumping, you know. Anyway, I had enough time by that time, which wasn't very long, just, just like maybe 30 seconds, actually. And I had enough time to think that we left Travis back there, you know. And that, uh, so I stopped the truck. And several of the guys were saying, why are you stopping? We got to get out of here, you know. Uh, and they were—they seemed to be frantic about that. I mean, all of them. And uh, and so we we got out, we got out of the truck. I mean, I think uh, Alan Dallas and, and uh, John and and, and uh, Ken Peterson, of course, uh, who was right next to me, and uh, uh, Alan Dallas got out, and uh, Steve Pierce. Anyway, everybody eventually got out. Now there's two two of the guys that are that are still alive and uh, talking about this, and that's Steve Pierce and and John Gillette. Uh, Kenny Peterson is, has we've heard from him. Okay, somebody has anyway. They told in fact Travis told me himself here a few, few uh, months ago that uh, Travis that uh, Ken Peterson was spotted. Uh, by some people at, a, at an event Travis was at down in Phoenix here uh, a few months ago. And uh, so that's all I know about Ken, okay? okay. All I know is, is he's not talking about this. He doesn't, he doesn't seem to care, but apparently he is alive. Anyway, uh, once we all got out, uh, we looked back, and, and those who were out of the truck at the time saw the... Uh, whatever it was, what we saw was a light in the trees, okay? Because being that far away and the, there was so much so much in the way that we saw this uh, light raise up and uh, and then streak off very quickly 
uh, and just disappear very quickly uh, towards uh, towards the northeast, if I remember correctly. Anyway, uh, and they will testify to that. Uh, those of us that are remaining, <laughs> myself, uh, and Steve uh, Pierce, Lett and Steve Pierce, yeah. So. What's your next question? No, what, and so I, I want to just ask you, you know, uh, prior to the incident, were you, you know, the UFO, uh, you know, the Betty and Barney Hill case was such an important case in the world of ufology. Had any of you ha heard the news about that specific case? And had any of you been exposed? Oh, actually, yeah, actually, uh, that, that particular night, uh, we were watching that. I can't remember how many. I know I was. Anyway, uh, I watched about, I don't know, maybe half of it. I don't even know how long it was, okay? But, uh, yeah, the Betty and Barney Hill case. And uh, uh, I, I can't even remember what channel it was on. Somebody told us about it. I think at the time we only had three channels. That's <laughs> no like I lived in this... Uh, uh, two-story uh, green house with white trim uh, on Main Street. Uh, and uh, so we, you know, I got tired of, after watching it for a while, I thought, you know, because at the time I was not, I didn't believe in UFOs. I, did, I, I really didn't. I thought it was all a bunch of nonsense. I, I was, uh, you know, one of these blind skeptics, you might say, you know. Uh, and so... You know, everybody was watching that, and I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. So I actually turned the TV off, you know, and nobody seemed to complain about that. You know, just, that was it. <laughs> we, went, we went about other things. But that's my story about Betty and, Betty and Barney Hill, okay? Right. Thank uh, you. To continue with Betty and Barney Hill, okay? Uh, I never met Barney. He died sometime, you know, way before. But when we were in... Uh, I think it was Connecticut uh, at a at an event put on by a guy named John uh, by the name of John White. And uh, when I was there, I met Betty Hill, and she was telling me about how Bigfoot. Uh, she talked to Bigfoot every day in her in her backyard, and I thought that's a little strange. <laughs> I mean, you can make what you want of that, but uh, that's uh, well, all I can tell I mean, you about Betty, uh, Betty Hill. Yeah, well, that's good. If that's good. That's good. And then so, but you anyway. had been exposed to that. And so when, you know, all of you were in, in the truck and that happened, I mean, what were your... Um, what were your first thoughts? I mean, all of you must have been terrified, and I'm well, sure each of you... my first thought was not to know what was going on, you know. And then Travis jumped out, and, you know, it went like that. As far as my own personal feelings is concerned, it went from, what in the world is, are these guys looking at? What's going on, you know? And then and from there, it the, wow. Uh, I didn't know what to think there for a few seconds. Uh, in fact, I didn't know what to think the rest of the day or evening. I mean... That was so unusual and so astounding. I couldn't, uh, I can't even describe it really. As far as feelings are concerned, uh, when we went back to the site, okay, after we stopped a while and argued about it, in fact, I think we even went up the what they call the rim road a little ways and turned around and came back. Uh, and, uh, you know, because some of the guys were saying, because a truck went by, we could see it from where we were, uh, a pickup truck, and it was honey season. So uh, the guy, somebody, somebody in the back seat was yelling, "Let's let's go let's go chase those guys. They've got guns." And I thought, "Guns? What in the hell? Get a gun?" That sounds like a fun like, pastime. Hey, sounds hey, good to me. That could be great. Them. We chased. I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile or something. I stopped and I turned the truck around. We went we went back. You know. And this time we went right back where we had stopped before, and we went on back on down uh, the hill there away to the uh, to the site, and I pulled the truck up into the clearing and showed my headlights on it, you know, basically in the clearing. I left the truck running. Well, we took a, a flashlight out of the, out of the, they did, you know, out of, out of the uh, glove box, and uh, we proceeded. Everybody got out. 
and uh, we basically, not arm in arm, but kind of shoulder to shoulder, you might say, we walked around through that clearing uh, and then circled out around more to the outside, you know, into the trees. And we couldn't find anything. Well, as far as emotions go, uh, I broke down. I actually went to my knees, and uh, I guess you could say I, I was crying. I don't know. Uh, I mean, Steve and John will both tell you that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did. But they don't. People don't understand what I meant by that. You know, where what was going on there? Uh, it wasn't so much. Uh, you know, the Travis was gone. It was because he was gone because we didn't find the charred body there. That's why. It, it was more uh, uh, tears of relief, you might say. And, and, and so uh, you see this beam of light and then you're, I mean, obviously you're in, in you have a fearful response and so your immediate response was because you saw this beam of light hit him that he was dead uh dead and, and charred from the heat of the light yeah well i didn't see the beam of light hit him but i saw him flying back after that yes anyway what was the question there you know so uh so um and so you have this experience and then you you know you Tell us where where it goes after that and how, you know, you, you were driving down the road and trying to get back. And I want to ask you one question, actually, while I'm thinking about it. What typically was your schedule and how late were you out at night? Was this unusual for you to be out this late at night? No, we, no, we were, we had been working late. Uh, I, I don't think, yeah, pretty much towards sundown for the, for the last, see, this happened on a, uh, um, I think it happened on a Thursday, uh, and you know, the, the, the previous three days uh, we had worked late. I don't remember how late. I, I think it um, it was really windy one day, and so we quit a little early. Uh, anyway, I have all those records. You know, I, I keep really good records, and I have them right here in my office. But. Uh, uh, you know, I'd have to go dig them out. <laughs> My memory isn't perfect. I just know where to look for them. That would be great. Uh, yeah. Anyway, ask me another question because I'm kind of lost here. No, no, no. Okay, so you, so you, you have this experience. Travis is is gone, and then you make your way back to to town. And so, describe what the conversation was when all of you were in the truck after this happened okay well once we hadn't couldn't find travis and uh, we all got back in the truck and we uh, went very slowly <laughs> out out to the main road and down the rim road and then down this i can't remember the name of that road but we went down it rather steep and windy road uh and we you go down to a, to uh, a place where now there's some white uh, pipe rail fence, uh, you know, it wasn't there before, but anyway, you turn right there and you go on down, pretty soon you get to Heber, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like maybe, I don't know, 16 to 18 miles altogether. And once in Heber, uh, I mean, all the way down there, it, it, hardly anybody spoke. I mean, really, just hardly anybody. And, uh, once, once we got into Heber, I was, I was saying, okay, somebody needs to call the authority. And I said, and I certainly don't want to say anything to anybody about it being a UFO because they'll think we're absolutely crazy. So Ken Peterson elected to, to go call, and he did. And he called the local uh, police, or whatever you call it. Turned out to be a, uh, an undersheriff by the name of uh, Chuck Ellison. And uh, Ellison then radioed the uh, the sheriff in Holbrook, and his name was uh, Gillespie, Marlon Gillespie. Mm -hmm. And when they came down from Holbrook, which took him, I guess, maybe 30, 35 minutes, uh, which is 
kind of fast. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, who, the, a guy by the name of uh, uh, anyway, he was an under sheriff, and like uh, Sheriff Gillespie, right right hand guy, and he was a total skeptic. So when they got there, uh, he, the, the skeptic undersheriff started looking through the truck and, and looking at us and, and acting very strange, you know, like, you guys are a bunch of nuts, you know. Uh, Gillespie, on the other hand, uh, just was very professional about it, you know, just was asking questions and, and everything like that, you know. And uh, anyway, that night, we conducted a search for Travis. Unlike you'll see in the movie, you know, we actually went back that night. There was three of us, me, uh, Alan Dallas, and, and uh, Ken Peterson. Uh, John Gillette drove the truck back into town with uh, uh, Steve Pierce and Dwayne Smith. And uh, anyway, we spent, I don't know, maybe maybe an hour looking around for, for Travis and we couldn't find anything. There were no tracks in the road. Of course, we found the actual site, but he went down, they had a, they had a four wheel, four wheel drive. And, uh, we went down and it was, uh, like a, like a, a, a six, six places for six people to set. I don't remember what brand it was. But I just remember the color and I remember the fact that it was four wheel drive. Anyway, uh, we went, went down and, and looked for uh, a Travis that night and uh, for about an hour and couldn't find anything and uh, and so we went home anyway I won't get into details about how we get home and all that stuff but we went home but uh, the very next day early the next morning uh, Gillespie had a bunch of uh, searchers out there and uh, I got there kind of late you know uh, after they were already at the site, uh, I, I went there with uh, Travis's brother, uh, Dwayne Walton, who was there by that time. And uh, he lived in, in the valley in, uh, in the Phoenix area. Anyway, but, uh, during the search, uh, this under sheriff, the skeptical under sheriff, kept asking all of us that were there. Uh, where'd you hide the body you know stuff like that and uh, uh, yeah there were people on horseback a bunch of them and uh, there were uh, I don't know how many men out there searching something like 50 or, or so and uh, I, I pretty much stayed at you might say the Grand Central Station <laughs> of the spot and, uh, and uh, you know I didn't go out searching with anybody. Uh, in fact, uh, the guys that were with me, they didn't either. At one point, we noticed that uh, there were these guys with, with, with some things that looked like Geiger counters, okay? And I, I went over to one of them, and I said, oh, what are you doing, you know? And he said, well, we're looking for radiation. I said, okay, well, uh, check up. So I said, well, see if there's any radiation. Well, he ran, and he ran his machine over, us, and there wasn't any. So I said, all right. Uh, I'm going to go get, get our hard hats, which I did. Uh, either I did or one of the other guys went down and got them. <clears throat> anyway, brought them up. And uh, for some reason, it, the uh, you could hear the clicking. and It, it started clicking really loud. And this this guy, uh, I don't know who he was. He was dressed like a Forest Service uniform, right? In fact, all, all three of them were. But uh, he... Uh, rolled up his machine and, and the three of them walked away. It walked up over the, over the ridge and, and disappeared. <laughs> I thought, well, fine, you know. Uh, anyway, altogether, the search uh, ended up taking four days. Uh, it ended uh, sometime Sunday afternoon. Uh, and uh, on Monday, in fact, uh, on Sunday afternoon, I was back in town. In fact, everybody was back in town that afternoon. So I don't know what happened to the site. I just I just know that they they kept searching. Oh, oh, and there were two helicopters involved. They they used two different helicopters with the parked there on the railroad, and 
and uh, I saw those uh, it's either the second or third day I can't remember but uh, anyway when that afternoon that Sunday afternoon back in town uh, Sheriff Gillespie came right to us and asked us if we would take polygraph tests and I said uh, well yeah okay uh, uh, Steve Pierce said uh, I don't know about that <laughs> Uh, anyway, I figured we'd better take him, so, and, and Alan Dallas wasn't anywhere around. I couldn't even find him, but uh, we got word to him about the, uh, about the polygraph test, so all six of us showed up in Holbrook on Monday morning, somewhere around 8 o'clock, and we found a whole bunch of the reporters in front of the, the steps of the, it was the, it was the old courthouse, it isn't anymore, in fact, but now, as of this moment, it's a museum, okay? But at the time, it was it was the uh, police station in Holbrook, basically. And uh, we went in the door, got through these reporters and stuff, and went in, and we went upstairs on the second floor, and, and this, uh, and very quickly, uh, a guy showed up. His name was uh, Cy Gilson, very stern-faced looking guy. And, uh, he, he was asking us you know, basically to, to be kind of trying to explain to us what he was going to do and everything, but nobody was really listening to him, you know. And uh, at one point, he walks over uh, to me and he pops me on the shoulder at the, pretty hard. At the same time, he said, you aren't lying, are you? He popped me on the shoulder. <laughs> I looked at him like, the hell are you doing? You know? <laughs> We went ahead and took the exams, and they they chose uh, Steve Pierce first because he was the youngest, apparently. Uh, apparently, uh, actually, uh, according to Steve, John Gillette was only 16 at the time. But, you know, I don't know anything about that. That's just according to Steve. Anyway, uh, Steve went first, and uh, the examiner thought he would, I mean, I, did, I learned all this from the examiner later. And... Uh, he told me that Steve uh, was the youngest and uh, thought he could, he could, because he was the youngest, he could get him to break, you know, something like that. But uh, he was amazed by that because Steve passed the test. And then, uh, I don't know who was next. I do know that I was fifth, okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know who was after me, but uh, I, was, I was fifth in line. And of course, once, once the examiner uh, got done with that, the test, which was for like two hours each and lasted up into the evening, I mean, it was dark outside by the time this was over. And uh, he turned around. I mean, I mean, I caught him walking down the stairs, and I said, "Hey, what what about the test? What what happened? You know?" And he says, "Well, one one of the tests was unusual." Is the uh, uh, Alan Dallas, uh, his test was inconclusive. I said, well, what about the rest of us? And he says, well, he says, usually I have, I got somebody look at this first, somebody to get a, you know, another opinion or whatever, but he says, from what I can see, all of you passed. And so uh, we were all relieved at that point. And uh, anyway, the rest is history. <laughs> And, and so let me ask you, because there was the National Enquirer, you know, and obviously the National Enquirer gave a, a hefty sum for a UFO case. And so at what point did the National Enquirer come into play? And at, at what point did Travis Walton take a lie detector test for the National Enquirer, which he failed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he did, and the guy that did that test was was named uh, McCarthy. I, I don't even know his first name. I don't think it was ever written anywhere, but anyway, his, his last name was McCarthy. And, uh, yeah, that was for the National Enquirer, and, and he, he flunked the test. But Travis flunked one other test uh, recently. Well, not all that recent. Here, five, six years ago, he was in California. Uh, taping a show uh, for to, to tell the truth, I think it's what they called it. And he uh, 
he was due to he was due to make a hundred thousand dollars if he could answer all the questions. Well, he answered all of them except for the last question, and the last question was, uh, "Were you really abducted by a UFO?" I think it was, was the terminology, and uh, he he uh, they reported that he failed the question. Now I I've seen uh, a copy of that since. Okay. And I've always wondered, why in the hell didn't he take me with him? Actually, Travis has uh, tried to keep me out of everything uh, since uh, the last 30 years, at least. Why? Why would everything. he? Why? Why? I think because he doesn't like anybody uh, in his limelight, <laughs> so to speak. You know? I mean, I don't know why. And so when, after all of this happened, and you mentioned 30 years ago, what specifically happened 30 years ago that would cause that kind of tension? And it, I mean, it seems like... Well, I can tell you where it broke, okay? We were over in San Francisco uh, doing a, a speak, having a speaking engagement, and Travis and I would, would do it together. And uh, Dr. Uh, always my slide... It was my slide of my paintings and whatnot that we used, plus photographs of everybody and all that stuff. And I would I would run the uh, I, I would be first uh, to speak, and uh, and Travis would uh, usually run the because you know, sometimes you have this this little clicker thing that you use and you can run the slides yourself. But uh, whenever you didn't have that, Travis would do it. Anyway, then he would come up, okay, and then he would do his thing, and uh, uh, and I would run the slides for him. So anyway, uh, in San Francisco, at this event, we were waiting at the airport for Travis to show up because uh, this, they sent this cute-looking girl, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, she was our ride, right? And uh, Travis didn't show up. And he didn't show up on the next plane either. And he didn't show up on the next one either. And they were these were Southwest flights out of Phoenix that ran every 30 minutes. So here we were. I was I was a half hour early, easy. So by the time uh, we, were, we were halfway into what would be the time we're supposed to speak, I said, we need to go. We need to just get over there, okay, which we did. And I did my half of the thing like I usually would, waiting for Travis. And then this girl uh, got a phone call from, from Travis because he had her number two, just like I did. And uh, and and uh, she, he, uh, this girl says, here, she handed me her phone and she said, here, Travis wants to talk to you. I says, what? And Travis says, what the hell are you doing? You trying to, are you trying to take the show over yourself? I said, what in the world are you talking about? You were late. You were late. The only reason we left was to get this started, hopefully, on time. If, if I hadn't have come over here, we would, we wouldn't, everybody would have gone home. He says, I don't care. He says, uh, you left me with no ride. I said, Travis, shit. you know, I said, just forget it. Just, and I hung up on him. And then he shows up uh, a few minutes later and did the rest of his thing, you know, and I ran the slides for him. That was where the break came. I couldn't believe he would tell me that. I couldn't believe it. And uh, so I never did another another thing with him after that. But it wasn't because I didn't want to. It was because I wasn't going to be humiliated or have him talking to me like that, like I'm taking his show. You know, that's absurd. But that's Travis. It's always been the way he is. And, and, and so what, I mean, and, and so what happened after that rift? I mean, what did you do personally with that? Did you walk away from the situation or? Well, yeah. In fact, uh, we were due to do those, that same uh, stream, uh, that same lineup of, of, of shows the next year. And I negotiated to get double the money the next year. But Travis wouldn't even talk to me. So I just let that go. I have no idea what he did after that. 
and all it, I know is, is I was no longer involved because I just wasn't going to be treated like that have him act that way towards me uh, because that's just stupid for him to act that way and, and so what I mean yeah I mean that, that must have been difficult when you were trying to to do things together what at that point in time where were where was everybody else that had been in the truck that night and and Travis's family and the people that were directly involved in the case what what was their stance what do you mean by what was their stance? well so I mean so at, at the 30 year mark when you had this this rift where where was Steve Pierce? Where were the other well, people that, involved? That rift happened in, uh, in 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 the year two thousand. And where was Steve Pierce at the so time? That, so that was that was twenty one years ago. And had and um, so Steve Pierce. I mean, he's been kind of in in this and then out. And I actually saw him at a conference uh, a few years ago. But he he had. From my recollection, he had mentioned that initially this this might have been a black ops program. Well, I don't know. Steve Pierce has so many different theories and, and uh, stuff. I really don't know. I can't answer for Steve Pierce. <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't been to any convention or anything since uh, the year 2000. And so, so you haven't had, have you had any contact with uh, Travis since that oh, time? Yeah. yeah, all the time. In fact, uh, just a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah. And how are things, are you guys okay now or what's... No, no, we're still bickering and, and uh, the truth is, uh, Travis has been selling his book, which he either self-published or got more copies from uh, Marlowe and company, I don't know. Uh, but he has an agreement with me for 35% of book sales. And and for the last 15 plus years, uh, he hasn't paid me a single dime. And I know a number of people who, who have purchased books from him, either at conferences or or by mail or whatever, and uh, we're talking. He he is asking like thirty dollars for his book, plus shipping and handling or whatever. The conference of the course, there's no shipping and handling, so I don't know what he's charging there. But uh, altogether, that could amount to an amazing amount of money, and he hasn't given me a dime. So needless to say, I expect that money, and. Uh, I don't know what to do about it now because if I take him to court, I will definitely win because all he can produce is that contract for 35%. But my sister owns the house that he lives in, okay? My sister Dana, uh, by name, okay? So, uh, so Travis was covering his ass from way back when, when they first purchased that house and so forth. And in, in uh, I don't know when that was, but uh, Travis did that, obviously. Dan, Dana has told me this. Yeah, she's told me about this. Uh, she says, that's my house. Well, fine. Uh, I know that if that, that winning in court, uh, what's that going to do? Travis won't pay, which means that uh, the only thing I could do is seize his house, but I'll be seizing Dana's house. <laughs> so there you go. And, and so, you know, with all of this going on, I know that there have been, uh, there's been a, a, an interesting interview with with you where um, it, it appears that you um, had said that this was a hoax. And then there have been, then you've, you've gone out and said that this wasn't and that there were things that were taking place that weren't factual and so can you clarify that because uh, that's well, been very interesting to see and I'm sure it's been uh, a, a tumultuous time lately <laughs> yeah well uh, since then I have negotiated with this guy Ryan Gordon and and uh, uh, I told him that I, I will say 
uh, no comment except that I am going to explain why. And other than that, I have uh, one comment. <laughs> In other words, I have several comments. But one of those comments is, uh, it appears to be a federal law to accuse somebody of digital manipulation. So I, I don't accuse him of that. You know, even though I, I did a while back, uh, I won't. And other than that, I can say anybody can digitally manipulate anything digital. Right. <laughs> and uh, and and uh, so that's basically it. I mean, uh, I have no idea what he did with that uh, recording of me. I have no idea, but I. Uh, but I can say, uh, you know, that, that much. <laughs> and so how did you first come into contact with him? Because I know that there are people in, in yeah, chat he, uh, that I'm seeing. He, uh, um, and let me just, he, and Steve, and, and, and excuse me for yeah. one second. There, there are all sorts of great questions in the chat room. And I just want to say thank you. And I'm sorry that I can't um, respond, but I've got the cell phone held up to the microphone but so tell tell us about yeah, when you first came into contact with him and what happened yeah well Ryan Gordon first requested my friendship on Facebook and he looked like a decent guy he certainly wasn't any bodacious sex day <laughs> <laughs> oh dear only, well you know, I checked out his page and, and he, he just says he's a photographer <laughs> self-employed photographer so, you know, uh, fine, I, I accepted his friendship. And uh, it went from there. Uh, it actually took him a couple of months to get to the point to where, in fact, uh, how it happened really was that he was telling me by email that, that Travis Wong had told him a whole bunch of strange stuff about uh, gentry Tower uh, being what we were all looking at that night, uh, that the incident actually happened under or near Gentry Tower. And what is Gentry and, Tower? And he also, uh, Ryan Gordon also told me by email that uh, uh, tra uh, that uh, Travis claimed to have boxed Muhammad Ali and that I was his water boy. You know, oh, another thing I remember is that uh, which Ryan Gordon told me was that Travis had told him that he had he had to abort his, his girlfriend's unborn baby Sweet. because they both uh, thought it was an, was an alien. <laughs> well, I mean that's <laughs> never that's uh, that's something right there, and and so um, okay, so you have this this tape that that Ryan put out of you allegedly saying that this situation was a hoax that you and Travis had initially and Dwayne had initially hoaxed yeah, the situation well, on, my Facebook, on my Facebook page I have two uh, prominent I've actually had them before asking him questions and then in fact uh, <laughs> my computer went off here but let me pump that up again real quick, and I can tell you exactly what it is and exactly what I said. Okay. All right. Okay. Get down here past my, my uh, granddaughter's birthday. And then, then I say, it is a fact that at the UFO site, W11-5-1975, I told Ryan Gordon on May 1st, there is no way it could have been a hoax. And then I say, since Ryan won't respond to that stated fact below, we must take his non-response to be an affirmation of that fact. Because I actually did say to him at the site that there is no way it could have been a hoax. And he has, has refused to answer that question. He has refused to acknowledge that. He just has refused. Absolutely. And so you had claimed, and I know I watched you on a, a couple other interviews that you did, um, and you you said that you had audio tape of him. Is that something that you would release 
just to get that out there? I, uh, yes, I do have an audio tape, but I, and I, I have the, the itty bitty little Sony tape recorder. You know, it's a, it's a digital with no moving parts, of course. And, and it's very small. Uh, you can, I can hide it in my sock. I can hide it in my pocket. You know, I can tape my leg or my side or whatever, you know. And it, it lasts, uh, it just goes on and on forever. You just keep on recording for, for hundreds of hours, actually. And uh, it comes out very clear. Yes, I did record the, what ha- what we both said. It was specifically me at the site. But uh, at this point, I don't want to give him any more, because that's what he did all this for in the first place, was to gain a name for himself. That's the whole thing it was about. And he is, from my from my knowledge, I'm not, I'm just coming into this in the past few days. But he is in the film industry, right? Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. I I couldn't tell you that. Okay. I can tell you that the uh, nineteen, I mean, eighteen ninety five film, uh, film Travis and I, at the site and in Snowflake. Uh, and here, uh, I guess, been about six weeks ago. No, about two months ago, and uh, he told the whole thing exactly as it was, uh, independently, separately, together. Uh, my friend Richard Gonzalez is, is sitting with us at one point. I don't know how much that, that they used, but that uh, is a two-hour documentary, and it's supposed to be on the uh, le- uh, le- I mean the. Uh, travel channel the travel channel uh, sometime in october and that's all i know of it at this point well it sounds as the... far as uh rg just uh just before before never known by anybody person uh i have no idea anything about him whether he's in the film industry whether he's tv whether he's anything I just know that he's somebody who, who is a would-be skeptic, and uh, he's a strange guy. <laughs> and so there there was never any time where you you said to him that this was a hoax, that you and Travis and Dwayne had, had uh, come up with? I have actually uh, promised him to say no comment to that. But I will say... Why? Because it appears to be a federal offense to accuse somebody of bid, bid manipulation. And I can say further that anybody can manipulate anything uh, digitally uh, if it is digital. So you can take it from there. Right. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, I mean, this is also interesting. And thank you for for talking about this. I appreciate it. I know that this is, um, you know, I think that this is it's it's all you know, this is like I said, this is such a pivotal case. I mean, you look at the Betty and Barney Hill case and then you look at this Travis Walton case. And this has been something that has has been in you know, I'm in all of our minds for 50 years, and I can't imagine how all of you felt, you know, with that initial thing. Did you ever think when all of this happened initially, and then and then the National Enquirer, you know, you that happened, that this would have legs like it did? Did you think? Well, I never would have believed it. No, uh, it has it has changed a lot of lives. It certainly has changed mine, it's changed Travis, it's changed our, both of our families, which are interconnected, by the way, because uh, Travis's kids uh, belong to him and my sister Dana. And uh, at, at present, about nine years ago, uh, Dana had a visitor, a friend of hers, who confessed to her that she had slept with Travis. And that's the point where Dana left Travis. And she moved up here to some apartments uh, in uh, Lakeside. And uh, that's about all I know about that. Now, since then, the house Travis lives in has gone completely to hell, literally. I mean, I was there. 
there just a couple of days ago, and uh, he has junk stacked, I mean, trash, literally trash stacked in his front yard. He has what you could call a, a car lot out front of used and broken down cars. Uh, there's only one car that he uses, and apparently that belongs to his son, Luke, I guess. But anyway, uh, in his backyard, it is just wall to wall, literally junk. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's, you know, and I will say that, I mean, I, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, it, it, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, I'm sure, behind the scenes and things, and I know that, uh, you know, with the personal relationships that you've had, I'm sure that it, it makes it difficult, you know, uh, so. Yeah, well, I can tell you this, one look at Travis's house tells me a couple of things. It tells me number one that he is a major hoarder. Well, okay. I will. I, I, in, in his defense, I will say that I, I have, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love things, and I might, you know, and, and I, I get that, and I don't want to yeah, go. But you gather trash. Well, you know, it depends I'm on the about day. Trash in his front yard, literally trash. You know, stacked up kind of neatly in a way, sort of, but it's trash. And his backyard is full of what I call a chunk. Right. But I mean, and and I don't want to get too, and I understand that, and I don't want to get too, (laughs) you know, like off topic about, you know, him personally, because like I said, I've, I've met, met him and I've interacted with him on numerous occasions. And, and I, you know, I, I, all of us have skeletons in our closet, I think personal skeletons in our closet, Uh which, you know, which I would not uh, want to be, uh, yeah, well, you know. I don't have any skeletons in my closet. In fact, if you check my police traffic uh, criminal record, you won't find anything. So you don't have and a... I'm open. I, you know, I tell, I tell, people tell me I'm too open. Uh, I'm not very secretive. Uh, and I've never unfriended anybody or blocked anybody in my entire life. I haven't. And so do you... Personally or on... Facebook or anywhere. Right. And so do you, I mean, would you, is, is there anything that you go back to with regard to all of this when it first started? Is there anything that you go back to and do you regret? Regret? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, one regret I have is that Travis has apparently gotten to my daughter Cher, and my daughter Cher then took it to the to my other four older girls. Uh and, uh, yeah, I guess you call that a regret. But as far as the initial, but, but as far as the, the, the case, as far as, you know, when, oh, the case? yes, when, I mean, was, was this story well, concocted you know, you, you by, can't, uh, you, you can't hindsight anything. I mean, what happened happened and that's just the way it is. So why, why think you can do anything about it now? I mean, Today is now, right? <laughs> and so, did, I mean, did you and Dwayne and Travis hoax the case to make money? Because that is... No, absolutely mm-hmm. not. Travis and I didn't hoax it. Dwayne apparently didn't. I don't know anything about Dwayne. I know that Travis and I did not hoax the, the, the event. And that's that's good because you know, like I, I, as you know, I know that you know there there have been a lot of things going on with the recorded interview uh, that ha- has gone on, uh, you know, with uh, with Ryan and things, and so that has been um, it's been very interesting. And I I wanted to say that you know I again I I don't want to um, you know I want to give. Travis the ability to respond and I reached out to him today because I have always found him very kind and and uh, I really think that I, I would like him to respond so I will leave yeah. that out there um, and I'm, I'm sorry that this has been such a difficult thing for you do you think I mean so at the end of the day this was a UFO experience at the end of the day Travis was gone and he he I mean all of this took place 
to the best of your knowledge and what you all put forward was something that was true? Well, what I can tell you is we did not see, none of us, uh, other than trial, I mean, six of us who you'd call witnesses, did not see Travis Walton get abducted. We didn't see anything after that. Travis was gone for five days and some hours, and I have no idea what happened during that time. We did not see him get abducted. We didn't see him get taken. Uh, so we don't know. I have no idea what happened. You know, All I know is, is what we saw was real, and what we explained, what we, we said happened, uh, happened exactly. I mean, there were six of us all together. Two of us are dead, and one of us apparently no longer wants to com- com- uh, comment. Uh, Steve Pierce and John Gallette and I do comment, okay? And uh, Steve Pierce is a little bit, he has a whole lot of theories and stuff like that. But uh, uh, John Gallette uh, believes Travis 100%. For some reason, he says, Travis has never lied to me about anything. Well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All I can say is we didn't see him get abducted. And I've said that much on my Facebook page. So if you didn't see him and, get uh, abducted, do you fact, think that there one, could be yeah, some problem with this story? Was it, so I mean if you Say didn't again? so if you didn't see him get abducted, are you saying that there might be a problem with his story? I don't know. Yeah, I can't I can't speak for Travis, okay? <laughs> right, right. Uh, I used to believe him, uh, and now I have doubt. Because he's just done so many things recently that just seem crazy, uh, like the stuff that he apparently told Ryan Gordon, uh, the way his house looks. You know, I, Travis, I used to, I used to have faith in Travis, uh, his intelligence, his uh, self-respect. You know, apparently uh, all that went out the window here. You know, like ten years ago. Ever since my sister Dana left him. Right, and I don't uh, want to get into, is, yeah, to, to, I mean, to it, was, it was pretty, it was a pretty nice place. Right, yeah, and I don't, I mean, I, I, th- you know, like I said, we all have skeletons, and it's, um, I think the, the, at the end of the day, it, it is the UFO, uh, it, it's the UFO experience, it's what happened, you know, with the National Enquirer. How, how much money did everybody make with the National Enquirer? Uh, I, mean, I know there was a five thousand dollar prize. Uh, it was split. Uh, Travis got half of that, which would be like two thousand five hundred, and and the rest of it was split between the six of us. I'd have to get my calculator out here to figure out exactly how much I got, but uh, yeah, it's... I got one sixth. Uh, one half of <laughs> five thousand. And so let's let's go back to that because I think the history of the subject and that and the National Enquirer. I mean, the National Enquirer had quite a panel of of people that were involved in the UFO subject back in the seventies. And so, what were the requirements, if you can remember, for submitting a case to the National Enquirer and then winning the the money for the prize? Uh, it just it, it was. Uh, the best case of, of, of 1960, uh, 1975. That's all I know about it. I, I have I have copies of all that stuff in my files, you know. But again, I'd have to put the phone down and look at it. You know, the final, <laughs> you know? And so, like, what can you tell me? What um, when you had? So when when did you submit? the the story to the national Enquirer, and did that happen at the same time frame when all i didn't submit anything to the national Enquirer. i don't know who did that so it must have been travis then but you were i think it it might have been uh jim lorenzen okay and what was your interaction before he died he had a what did he call that uh, I can't remember what he called yeah, it. Yeah, Jim and Corey Lorenzo, right. Organization, right. You know, and, uh, and, and he was, he was in tight on it first. Jim Lorenzo, and he was in tight on it. I, I even went down uh, to Tucson, which where they lived, Charles and I, and, and ate dinner with them uh, one time. Uh, 
time. I have a funny story to tell about that. Yeah, I would love to hear that. This is great. <laughs> anyway, well, we were at this dinner. Uh, uh, Mrs. Lorenz and I can't, oh, her name was Coral, Coral Lorenz. And, uh, she had fixed a, a, a steak dinner, right, you know? And she, while we were sitting, getting ready to eat and stuff, she was talking about she belonged to this uh, uh, animal rights group. Uh, and uh, she was talking about how mistreated dogs were and stuff, you know? And, I, and we were sitting there eating, and I was sitting, I was saying, you know, Coral, why do you believe in, in mistreating dogs and we're eating beef steak? Well, that we probably went over like a that. lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> that, was the, that was the last words. That, in fact, that was my words, and Coral never spoke to me again. And so, who... And we were never invited down there again. Well... Although I heard Travis was. Well, and, and yeah. so when... So what year was that? Do you remember? Well, uh, that probably would have been uh, uh, 1976. And and two, you know, when you and this is a great and thank you so much for bringing this up because this is very fascinating to me the history of the subject. So, who else was involved in the UFO world when this story started to break? I know that Peter Davenport from uh, New the Fort. Main, the main skeptic was Philip Class, spelled K L A S S. And uh, did, do you have and, an? And we, we, Travis and I faced off with him on Larry King Live, and that was in 1973. And in fact, uh, that Larry King episode, we, we were in Washington, D.C., we, we went there in person, and uh, and we were on that show, and that, of course, could be found on the net, you know, various places, I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I kind of took uh, Phil Class to task, and uh, both Travis and I were laughing at him, you know, giggling at him. And uh, a lot of the apparently uh, skeptics, fellow skeptics, I don't know who they were, were saying uh, uh, that was that wasn't very nice. Laughing at Phil Klaus, and I thought, so so what? You know, <laughs> you know, uh, he did, you know he uh, he would actually go out of his way to change something in order to have his skeptical way. You know. But, well, that sounds a lot like people in the UFO. Well, I mean, you know, not, it, and I just have to say that I've seen people who are, are true believers in the UFO field who have gone out of their way to change things, you know, over the years. And so it, I think that goes both ways. But so you had an interaction with Phil Class. Mm -hmm. And so what, who else did you interact with? Who, who came in? And I, and I think this is very important when Travis was missing, were there people in the UFO world that came there and interviewed you? And how did that take place? Well, there were a couple of other skeptics at the time. Oldberg was one of them. And I had words with him, you know, like uh, by letter. Uh, in fact, uh, during this entire thing, Apparently, there's no, never been a skeptic uh, who has ever sent Travis Walton a letter or uh, called him or anything. Uh, I, I, I'm the one that handled the brunt of that stuff, and uh, especially with Phil Class. And Phil Class died here in, I think it was uh, 2002, and uh, a couple of, a couple of months before that, a couple, of, uh, maybe a year before that, I had a call. I had a call with him. Uh, which he initiated, called me, and uh, so I talked to him, and he talked rather friendly, and he kind of changed his tune a little. In fact, at one point, I, I felt that he was going to finally say, uh, I, I think it really happened, but he didn't ever actually say that. <laughs> and we, I used to send him uh, Christmas cards. Uh, I can't remember what years and everything. It was like three or four years in a row I was sending him uh, Christmas cards with deliberate religious themes because he was a devout atheist <laughs> well that's certainly one I, way to get I him going <laughs> him, I just kind of kind of get his goat oh. i would send him birthday birthday presents you know a couple couple of times uh with, with some sort of religious theme you know <laughs> just to get his goat <laughs> so 
know, I had a lot of fun with Bill Clough. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's interesting because I have had one of my friends, Barry Greenwood, who's a, a great uh, archivist and historian in the subject, he has talked about Phil Class before, and it, it seems like when you actually sat down and, and spoke with him that he was a very, um, that he was, a, you know, he was a nice guy to talk amicable. to. Amicable. Yeah, amicable. Yeah, absolutely. And so you were... Why were you put in charge of dealing with all of the skeptics and, and running defense? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's just that Phil Class uh, started picking on me, you know, and he never did try it. In fact, uh, he one, one time he told me, he accused me of being the ringleader, you know. <laughs> it was a hoax, a ringleader, a hoax. And he went on and on about it. I mean, he he, he said that, his theory was that uh, the whole group of us had made it up uh, to get out of a contract I had, and uh, and and, he, and it included Dwayne, you know, Travis's brother, Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne Walton. Anyway, and um, what contract was that? Uh, what was I don't remember. Uh, you know, I had several contracts over the years. Like I said, I've done tree planting, I've logged, I've uh, I've done timber stand improvement, I've done uh, you name it. I mean, as far as uh, work in the forest, uh, and of course, like I say, I have records of all that, and I have to go look in my files to find it all. To get, I can give it to you all exact, but I have to set the phone down and take the time to go <laughs> find it all. Well, it might be worth it. I don't know, but. So, so you had contracts that you, yeah, so keep going, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, you, so keep going, because you were talking about the contracts that you, that you had that might be, uh, that could be in peril with all of this. Well, I don't know what you mean by that, but, yeah, I've, uh, I've dealt with the skeptics lately, I've dealt with, uh, Michael Shermer, and uh, and more recently, it's uh, Robert Schaefer. And what do you? I mean, I I've had Robert Schaefer on my show before, and I've it, I he's he's an interesting guy. I know that there's a video clip where he was you know back back in the '70s, I believe, maybe '80s. He was on Geraldo. And he was sitting yeah. next to to Travis, and that was a very interesting exchange. And so, tell me what yeah. what your thoughts are on Robert Schaefer and how he's interacted yeah. with you over the years. Well, he, he's actually a friend on my face, uh, Facebook. Okay, uh, and I've I've had a few words with them. One time, I had to do with the Phoenix Light. I told him that I had uh, documentation that showed that it was. was likely not an extraterrestrial vehicle because it was going right along with the wind at the same elevation that the actual object went and that's been well documented but I apparently I'm the only one that ever looked into the uh, uh, National Weather Service you know archives and, and stuff which which I did right after uh, the Phoenix lights occurred and uh, I came up with the maps and uh, learned all that stuff because I witnessed it myself from a hilltop uh, near Prescott, Arizona. And I became very interested in that, you know, because I, it was very weird, very strange. I, I, uh, and so I went on down that very same evening and uh, uh, actually night and uh, I got a motel room in Phoenix, and, and the next morning I, I went to the TV stations and stuff, and uh, I can't remember exactly which TV station, but I, uh, I told them I wanted to find out what the weather was. Well, they said, check with the National Weather Service, so I did, and uh, that's when I found these maps, and then later on, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I got charged from them, and it all cooperates, and also... Uh, surface wind maps which are almost almost the same as the uh, upper atmosphere or you know mid tropospheric uh, wind patterns 
and uh, so altogether, it showed me there was a mountain of evidence, really, that uh, it followed it followed the wind. And what does that tell you? <laughs> you know. And nobody, nobody that I've ever on my Facebook or anywhere else, and certainly not Robert Schaefer. In fact, Robert Schaefer says it was definitely airplanes. Well, who knows? <laughs> right. All I know is that it's whatever the object was, it's well documented what it was, but or at least what the direction it went is exactly in line with the wind patterns, both both surface and mid tropospheric. And that's, that is fascinating. And so, I mean, what, and I have to ask you because I've got some great questions in chat tonight and I want to go back to the National Enquirer case. Did you ever come in contact with Bob Pratt? Did he investigate the case for the National uh -huh. Enquirer? Bob Pratt? Bob Pratt? Right. He was with the National Enquirer. So did you, and since... Oh, I, I don't remember okay. Bob Pratt. Okay. And so when you found out, and I want to go back to this again because this is so interesting to me, but when you, how long after you submitted or t whoever submitted the report to the National Enquirer, did all of you find out that you had won the prize? Uh, I, uh, somebody contacted us and we went down to Phoenix and uh, in, in the parking lot of a hotel down there there was a photo taken uh, with uh, Travis and, and the group, of, all except for one of us, I can't remember which one was missing but uh, we were all holding up a check and Travis Carter just promised, so hey, you can read his checks of uh, $2,500 you know, it was like a money order or something and uh, anyway uh, the rest of it can't be seen too well but we each had our uh, one sixth of two thousand. Uh, one sixth of uh, two thousand five hundred. <laughs> wow! And so, do, was that was that after we the? Put that, that was a photograph on in, in the National Enquirer and front page. And so, what do you say um, about? And I've got a question from uh, my friend in chat. What What do you say about Travis initially? Or, or failing the lie detector test for the National Enquirer? Uh, failing the test? What are you talking the, about? Well, so he, Travis failed the, the lie detector test for the National Enquirer. And, and so, yeah. what, I mean, what were your thoughts about that? What was I asked about it? What, I mean, what were your th thoughts about that? Why do you think that happened? I don't know. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like I've said many times, Travis is on his own and all this stuff. There's an awful lot Travis has done without me ever since the year 2000. <laughs> and so now when you look back on, on everything, because obviously this has been, you know, most of your life that you've had to deal with all of these things, how has that affected you? Do you think it's been a positive or a negative way that this has impacted your life? Well, like again, I say you can't you can't second guess you know that that stuff. I mean, uh, hindsight, you know, it, it, it's kind of what happened happened. Okay, what happened happened, and that's just the way it is. Uh, uh, so I don't look at it like it's impacted me negatively or positively because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm what you call basically unbiased. You know, I, I won't just make up my mind about something in advance. Uh, just not that way. And uh, so there are a lot of things I have to say I don't know because I don't. You know, there might be evidence for certain things that and evidence can be evidence, but actually, in reality, there's almost nothing that can be proven. Maybe a few things, but the word proof is kind of like a, an unnecessary term because all there really is is evidence. 
And, right. And and that's the thing, I think, you know, for me looking into this and, and um, when I first came into the subject, I mean, when I was a child, I, I started reading books. I mean, Whitley Strieber's Communion. I mean, I was just swept up in all of these things and really fascinated with the abduction cases. And as I've learned more and looked at the evidence that has been collected and, and looked at people's statements over the years, over the decades, there are inconsistencies that take place. And, and so that is, at the end of the day, that's, that's really important evidence to look at all of that. And, and, and I think that we all like to, you know, I, I think, <laughs> especially with the UFO topic, that things do eventually come to light and people who have not been truthful with things and this is I'm talking about things that I'm dealing with personally you know they they at the end of the day their story is told and so when, what I've asked on different shows with what I'm dealing with personally is uh, you know I'll throw this out there to the people that I know that have perpetrated hoaxes and have definitely hurt people you know, because you've got people like myself who have seen things and who want answers. And I get involved in this, and I'm looking to these great figureheads in the subject. And one by one, all of these people that I'm believing in, I'm finding out are either charlatans, they've made up uh, stories to manipulate people, to make money, um, for their own kind of sick uh, gain. And for me, that has been really devastating. And I do my show, I pay for my show <laughs> every every week because I feel that we deserve better. We deserve to be told the truth. And if I, I, I want to be empowered. I don't want to be fed a bunch of shit. Excuse my language, but that's exactly you know what I how I have well, seen and I'm like go along with that. so it's like at what point at what point do we just say you know god I'm you know I've you know we get older and I there are people that I've been you know dealing with that are up up in up in the years and they have decade after decade promoted things that are that is absolute rubbish garbage and I say to them is this what you want your legacy to be? You have got one foot in the grave and you're going to die uh, maybe, or you're, you know, you're, you're going to leave a legacy for your family where you've lied and you've made money and you've hurt people. And at what point, I mean, at, at what point do we say that, that that's not okay? At what point do we have um, uh, integrity and say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm down. I'm going to come clean with the kind of stuff that I've, I've promoted. And I'm not saying that that's happening with you. I'm just kind of going out on my own thing because this has been so personal to me. And do you, yeah. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Have you, over the years, have you seen people well, that you feel are not well, first, promoting the truth? First of all, I'll tell you, you know, more power to you. Find all the truth you can. Because as for me personally, I'm 74 years old now. And if there's one thing I've learned in all this time, I don't know anything. <laughs> but would you... I'm not even sure if I do. Okay. Right. And, and I mean, trust me, I, I have learned that if there's one thing I've learned is that I, I don't know anything when it comes to the subject. Well, actually, I know quite a bit about the people that are pulling the wool over uh, all of our eyes. But I mean, what... I mean, what what do you want your legacy to be in all of this since this has been such an integral part of your life? How do you want people to remember you? Uh, I guess they get most of that from my Facebook page, I guess. I don't know. Uh, what do I want to be remembered as? Uh, a human being, uh, a good guy. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, I know there's a lot of people who have a different opinion of that, but uh, uh, that's what I'd like. I mean, as I said, I, I don't have any criminal history. I don't have any police record. I don't have any, I don't even have a traffic record, to tell you the truth. Uh, 
I have been known to kick a few asses in the street and in the ring. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I've never, well, sta- a... never started a fight. I never won. So I'm one of those uh, deadly do rights, you know. <laughs> and so you're willing to do, if you see something that's wrong, you're willing to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is not okay, and I'm going to call this on the carpet and, and expose something that is is hurting people at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I should probably say more of that way. I should be more of that way than, I'm, than I am. Uh, I let a lot of things slide. Uh, but, you know, here, I don't know, it's been a couple of months ago, right out here in, in uh, near my house, but that way, there was a Mexican guy that came up to me and just started jabbering me. Now, I know a little bit of Spanish, so I, I uh, realized what he was trying to say, and I could, I could tell he was on drugs or something. He got on my face, and he started pushing me. And so I belted him and knocked him down. And uh, he just got up and looked at me kind of funny and walked away. <laughs> uh, but somebody has to push me to get, get in my face, you know, before I'll do anything. And I've, I've never in my life ever lost a fight. Never happened. But I don't I don't ever start a fight. That, that's true. And so you you are um, 100% you are backing up the story that this happened and that there was no hoax. Right. And and, 100%. and so with and with regard to Ryan, again, and I'm sorry, to, I apologize for bringing this up. But this is important. But when did you know what when he reached out to you and when you had conversations and then he played the interview with you? What happened in that interview and what were you specifically referring to that he recorded? Because it seemed like you well, know there was a conversation. Well, I remember specifically referring to was uh, uh, an incident Travis Wallen and I talked about in the woods a number of times about what happened specifically in 1977 when we were working back in the woods in 1977 and uh, so I, I was referring to what Philip Class had said uh, about it all and uh, that's what we were discussing uh, that particular day and uh, And unfortunately, you were going to call Mike back because the phone call just dropped. Of course. Why does this always happen? We're calling him back. You get this live on the air, and now you actually get to see video. Before it was just. Yes, there we go. (laughs) Sorry, the call just dropped. Well, you know, it's. Anyway. So go ahead. Uh. I don't even remember where I was. <laughs> and so, I mean, talk about the, you know, with with regard to Ryan and what what happened and how that played out. And and I would love to because we are getting used to. Um, we're, I mean, we're we've got different questions and things, and I want to ask specifically about the the lookout uh, that you know well, we were. I have I have I have agreed, and I keep my agreement. I have agreed to say no comment, but I also told him that I will explain that, okay? Uh, And I've already explained that to you, so I guess we'll just leave it at that as far as Ryan Gordon is concerned. Okay. And so do you have any plans to, I mean, are you doing anything with this case? Are you, what are your plans in the future? Do you do you, are you going to do any more TV shows well, or a movie? You know, I used to be on the radio uh, with KGRA, and uh, and I talked about things, but I but I stayed. In fact, the, I called myself the realist. Okay, that was the way my show was titled, the uh, realist. Uh, and I tried very hard to make it that way. Now, the other the other uh, show hosts on KGRA, which there were several. Uh, didn't you know? They didn't seem to. It didn't seem to bother them that they just delve into the subject like as if it was one uh, real, and they went along with everything. I didn't do that, and that was part of the problem. Uh, why it, it ended? In fact, uh, 
this guy, Race Hobbs, who at one time owned uh, KGRA, uh, as long as, as Bill Forte was my producer, everything was fine. Then finally, about six weeks prior to the show ending, uh, Race Hobbs took over the producing. And during that time, in five weeks, he only produced uh, two shows out of five possible shows. And so I finally, I told him, I said, you know, this was like on the phone, I think, or text, I can't remember which one it was, but it was, you know, a direct thing. And uh, and I, I, I told him, I said, why in the world, why, why didn't you, what happened was, I said, at one time I was sitting there waiting, waiting for you. And he just up and said, well, fuck you, Mike. And that was the end of it. Well, that's, that was the end of the show right there. That's, I, yeah, that's never good. Um, but, um, so I am looking at the chat and there's some really great, and I just want to say this, there's some great comments in there and I'm sorry guys that I can't get in here because I'm holding the phone up and respond to, to things. Um, and I want to say, Becky, thank you uh, for your nice comments and Tracy, it's nice to see you and and all of you um this is the second week that i've done the the video and so i'm still working on things clearly um but i'm, I'm wondering if because it looks like ryan is in chat and i don't know if you would like to have a conversation with him uh, the last thing i told ryan uh, which was uh on phone text and uh, uh email i told him i'm tired of this subject do what you want, I'm done with it. And that's all I said. That was my last word. And so you're willing to walk away from the subject? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I mean, I agree, agree to certain things, but uh, other than that, I'm done with it. You know, you know he, I know, I know for certain that he, you know, I, I pretty much presume that he uh, did this in the first place just to make a name for himself. In other words, a would-be skeptic. And he was unknown before that. And so, you know, I don't want to further his name, and I don't want to argue with him anymore, and I don't care what he does. Just let it go. Well, that's, that's, my, that's my final word on it. Okay. Thank you. And, I mean, I, again... Um, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking about all of this. And um, this has been a, a really interesting <laughs> show this evening. And I wish that yeah, I could see. It yes, it has. I wish that I could see you on video because I think that that would, um, you know, it would be great to see your face. And this is one reason that I'm excited about the new show if I can get over some some kinks and I want to just bring in Scott Brown um, which I'm not sure if Scott is ready for this but I want Scott uh, who is the wonderful man who's been doing all the graphics for the show he's been a friend of mine for a long time he's an in the field a wonderful uh, group of people and so Scott I just want to ask you do you have any questions yeah uh, Mike can you hear me um, I don't know if Mike can hear you. Let me just turn. Let me just do this really quickly. No, I can't, I can't okay. Okay. So here we go. Let me do this. And I apologize for the audio, but Scott asked that again. All right. Um, so, so did the, did guy, the guy? Oh, it's. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I can't hear what he's saying. Okay. Scott asked the question, and then I will ask you. Transfer the question. Right. Right. So. I, I have, have heard in certain cases that before the incident happened, that some of the guys and some, and some of the friends of the Travis, uh, uh, you can make fun of him because of his interest in the subject. Okay, and so let me just stop right there. So this is the what this is where the question is leading. It it sounds like from what Scott is saying that Travis had friends before all of this happened that i mean they were making fun of him because he was interested in the subject do you remember that 
Yeah, I remember that. Um, well, what was the rest of the question? Because I couldn't hear anything. Right, I know, and I'm sorry I'm trying to do this on the fly. It's very exciting, let me tell you. Um, so, Scott, what? So, what's the rest of the question about that? And then I will give. Oh, that was it. That was it. So, so Travis liked. He was into the subject before uh, all of this took place. Okay. And so, I let me ask you now uh, because this is very interesting. I've got a, a great question from Shadowy Spectrums. Did the military ever speak to you about the subject? It's... No, not directly. Although. Travis and I both know that we've been watched uh, ever since ever since the event right to the present time. In fact, uh, uh, where I live right now, uh, there was a guy came in my house uh, pretending to be a social security agent, okay? And I very quickly tripped him up because he, is, he was saying things that uh, was, was different because I have a, a Sony Vio computer, okay? Uh, which I've never hooked up to the net, and I have an awful lot written on it, and an awful lot of stuff. That's what I basically did on my creating of the, uh, the CGI on since the, the paintings uh, that I did for Travis today. And uh, he uh, he was saying a na names that weren't right, and that, which that that told me that he wasn't for real. And so I hit I hit him with him. I said, you know, you're not who you say you are. Tell me who you are. And he proceeded to tell me he's with a security agency uh, that has had man of surveillance for a long time. And in fact, uh, at one point we became friends. In fact, uh, my granddaughter Zelly, when she was two years old, she, she's the only one who was here and she saw him. And, uh, and so I have a, a bunch of drawings that she did when she was two years old, which happens to be incredibly brilliant because since then uh, her, her artistic ability has kind of dwindled you know with crayon stick figures and stuff like that but at the time she drew a number of, of pictures of this guy and uh and all uh, what she remembered though he's a uh uh agent call it agent agent man oh <laughs> whoa and uh so that's pretty cute. You know, I still have those. I have no fight. My fight over here, like everything else. Well, that's it's it's interesting, and um, you, you never know what happens. And I again, like I said, I thank you for for coming on here, and and so I just again, just for the fiftieth time, the recording that you made where you said that this was a hoax that had nothing to do with the initial event. Is that <laughs> no comment? Okay. So no comment. Does that mean yeah. it might? Because I keep my promises. Okay. What what promises? And, uh, anyway, Eric, I wish to thank you. For no, thank you, thank you. Speak, you know? I appreciate it. I yeah, yeah I appreciate gone. it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very, very much for being here. I appreciate it, and this has been an interesting interview, and I'm very glad that you could, we could figure this out, and I could hold my cell phone up, which I will say my right bicep is going to be a little larger than my left bicep tomorrow, but hey, whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, and Scott well, said thank you. you Erica and Scott. Yes, thank you so uh, much. It's, it's been fun. <laughs> it's pretty much fun. Yeah, so, no, no, I appreciate uh, it. Know, I, I laugh a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah no thank you very very much for being here i appreciate it so all right, uh, all right you have a good night thank you, thank you and so uh there there you have uh that and and so um and i appreciate him being here this is a very interesting evening for all of us and i i want to just tell all of you that i you know, like I said, I have uh, known Travis over the years, and I have reached out to him, and I would very much want to hear his perspective on this because this has been an, an important case. This is certainly something that that I have, um, you know, this is it's it's this is all blowing my mind a little bit, and so I wanted to, uh, with that, uh, just say that if you're up for 
a little bit more of the show. And thank you, Jeff. And I want to say thank you, Lou B. And, and I mean, everybody that has been here, Andrew Hall, all of the people that are finding me on YouTube and who have supported UFO Classified for, oh my gosh, seven years. And Mario, uh, who was in the field, I met Mario from Scott. I have the most amazing support system. And ha had it not been for all of you, I would not be continuing. And I, I want to just say this before we maybe continue on. And, um, and I'm clearly buying stock in Depends. Yes. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Oh, no. Oh, well, I mean, I, what can I say? I don't know. Let me, let me tell you. Two hours without a break is, is a marathon. Um, but, I, again, I want to say that I appreciate all of the people from from all over the world, I get people that are contacting me and have questions, and I also get the bullies that are taking after me that, of course, hide behind pseudonyms and in their little, you know, packs of uh, people that are probably sitting in their mama's basement bullying people and, you know, good luck to you, whatever. Um, but uh, I, so this has been an interesting journey. So thank you all for supporting the show and you can go to ufoclassified.com to become a patron and support the show. So I uh, am not paying for the pleasure of being here. And I want to thank the people that do support the show. So thank you very, very much. And so now, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, is Ryan here? And thank you, Jim Morris. Uh, this, this, is a, this was a difficult interview. And like I said, I would love to talk to Travis about all of this. And so, um, and thanks, Steve, I appreciate it. And so is, is uh, it, Scott, what's, what's happening now? Mama's going cross-eyed. I think he might, is he streaming in? I'm not sure. I sent him the link, but. Okay, okay. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to go on visual, he just wants to do audio. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to let, let me just see, um, yeah, Ryan, are you, you there? Okay. I sure am. Okay. And so I am going to just let Scott, you and Ryan, um, talk a little bit about this. And again, I want to make sure because I don't, I, I don't, it's, I, this, yeah, I don't want to necessarily trash people personally. Um, but I, I understand that there's something here that we need to, to talk about, and I want you to be able to refute some of the statements that were made tonight specifically because they do in, involve you. And so if you wouldn't mind doing that. Oh, did we lose him? I think he's not connected. I think we lost him. I think we lost him. Okay. Well, he might be trying to stream from his phone. Okay. So what I would definitely say, and we did lose him. And so what I would propose is that next Friday, uh, we could bring on Ryan. Oh, here he is again. I'm going to add him to the stream. Okay. So let's see. We've got to take your, oh, Lordy, um, hold the phone. Mama Sita. Okay. Baby Joseph. Ryan, you're there. I'm here. You're there. Okay. So hey. you, are you okay, are we groovy? Yeah. Can you guys see me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. Okay. So okay. Gonna... Sorry, sorry to everybody first. I'm sitting here in my hoodie and a ball cap. This was not a planned interview for me to be on here. But that was incredibly painful for for me to sit back and watch, I listen to. I suppose you should say, I I've been working with these folks since June of 2020, and I I of course wish that Mike would have had respectfully the courage to stick around. I it's not my intent to bad mouth. Go ahead. Do you have something playing in the background? This show? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's picking that up. <laughs> okay. I just muted my television. How about that? Groovy. Groovy. Yeah. 
Okay, so what, what I was saying, in case there was a, a lot of reverberation there, is this was not a planned interview. I'm sorry that I'm in my hoodie and a ball cap, but this literally just came to fruition. <laughs> I, it was painful to just sit there and listen to all that. And of course, I, I wish that uh, Mike could have stuck around, had, had the courage to, to debate me on this. Um, to start, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to give a bit of a background to what led up to that call. No, please go ahead. Okay. So I met Mike right around the 23rd of April this year. I did not randomly add him on friend, uh, Facebook. We had not talked several months, nor had I emailed him for several months like he alleged on this show. I met Mike with a film crew out at what, what the public knows as the abduction site. Mike was there filming with MUFON, the White Mountain chapter of MUFON, and I was out there with my own crew. I, Scott, I have sent you a copy of our uh, first communication. Certainly not asking you to, to choose sides, but it would be fantastic if you're able to affirm that our first communication was not a random friend request or anything like that, but instead a, a professional dialogue about filming. I do affirm that. And <clears throat> you've been completely honest with me, um, you know, not, not trying to trash anybody or anything, but, uh, you know, everything that you've told me so far and all the evidence that you've shown me, there's a lot of discrepancies going on with, you know, some of Mike's story. So. Right. I, so what I was hoping to do was, again, just give a, a brief background to, to what led up to that call that day. I, I want to say right off the top of my head, it was the 23rd of April, so what, three three months ago-ish. And uh, the following day, Mike and I had spent several hours on the phone. Mike was aware, and I have him on recording, telling me that I have permission to record all interactions with him. I think that that's important here. The reason why is I was in the process of working with Travis Walton, on selling a remake of his show, uh, Fire in the Sky. When you folks have heard about a, a remake that is with me, which Mike has confirmed on other podcasts that he's done within the last several days. I, anyhow, so Mike and I had chat for several hours uh, the following day. I. Overall, I, I would say a pretty good call. Uh, perhaps not as dry as what we just heard. That was pretty rough, but uh, <laughs> it was it was overall a pretty good call. I I at that point had a lot of information from working with Travis for for as long as I had on this remake, and Mike was very curious about our production. At that point, he was not a I, nobody had contacted him to, to be a part of it, which was an allegation that he, of course, has said himself with this. I, anyhow, on, on the day of the, the 30th, which is when that call was recorded, I had already spent roughly six, six hours-ish on calls with Mike. He would text me frequently. I have shared a lot of these text messages with you folks. Uh, he, he texted me just before 7 p.m. on the 30th, telling me that he had a secret that he wanted to whisper in my ear. And that I would tell him, I told him that I, I would call as soon as I could. You both have copies of those text messages. And I'm hoping that again, if I continually ask you to affirm, because we don't have a way to show these, right. is that accurate? Yes. But he's yes. telling me he has a secret he wants to whisper in yes, my ear. No, I did. We did see those text messages, yes. Okay. I. So I was driving 
in my truck. I live in the same town as these folks uh, six months out of the year. I'm in an RV right now, in case you guys can't tell. I, I travel around and this is how I how I work as I go from job site to job site working on different projects. Uh, anyhow, I told Mike that I, I would call him as soon as I could. He lost his patience and he called me in the, the town of Pine Top and everywhere around in the in the White Mountains. You're not allowed to drive and talk on the phone. I, my truck is a little bit older. It doesn't have Bluetooth. So are you guys still there? Yeah, I am. We're okay, here. this my We're my here. screen my screen changed. Anyhow, I know I'm playing the uh, settings. I'm sorry to throw you off. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so he called me while I was driving. What what I expected him to say or what the secret was was just more a bad mouthing about Travis. I, as you can tell, that's what he kind of likes to do, unfortunately. Right. And um, instead. He he, the, the secret was what what y'all heard on that call. So as I'm driving, I'm telling him to to hold on. I'm going to show you guys something here. So I wear my watch on my right hand. This is the Apple Watch that recorded that call in my iPhone. So I pull over to the side of the the road so I don't get in trouble with the police for talking and driving, and I'm telling Mike, hold on, hold on. And when I get pulled there, I say, okay, pick up where you were. And he starts out immediately with what I remember, all I can remember. And he uses a visual stimulation to this tree stump and chainsaw sitting on a tree stump where he is actively discussing with Travis Walton a, a hoax, how to hoax this event. It's, it's really important to know, and I think you touched on it here in your interview, that the National Enquirer had put out a hundred thousand dollar reward for a UFO story. Right. It's roughly a million dollars in today's money. And uh, the week before that, and you touched on it as well, the uh, Betty and Barney Hill case was on. Right. Anyhow, so they're discussing this. Uh, how to put this together? You hear him say that on the call. He he's pausing because he knows he's being recorded. He's pausing, he's being careful with his words. When he speaks, he's using a lot of ah, uh, ah, uh, just like he did on your interview here. And he's, he's thinking about what he's gonna say. For me, the number one job of, it, of somebody listening to somebody, just as you've done here, Erica, is really to stop talking and just be quiet. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's what you hear me doing. I'm not asking him questions. I've been accused of leading him on, leading questions. I don't ask him anything. After hearing him talk for a little bit, I, I do verify, and you hear me say it, are you telling me that you and Travis together hopes this event? And he answers in the affirmative, but he doesn't want to take all of the, the, the blame himself. So he also implicates Dwayne Walton in this as well. And then follows that up with a the, the uh, what Philip Class had had said about this. So from a production standpoint, and you hear me say it, I'm telling him I need to know the how, the why, all of this, and I, I'm starting to tell him this from a production standpoint, what this would look like for him, what this would look like uh, for a show. And he interrupts me, and he tells me, "Well, why don't you take me to dinner first? Something to that effect. Let's go to dinner. Let's talk about it at dinner. Yep. And the, the, the conversation switches over to uh, talking about Mexican food and all these other things. I left that in there on purpose because I knew that if I cut it, say right about the 92nd mark, everybody would question what happened after. So yeah, there's this boring talk of restaurants and everything else, but that was left there intentionally. Right. Now, I, I'm going to go over a couple of hard facts with you here. I, and I believe I have also sent you guys the proof and evidence on this as well. But I'd like to read it, and this is what I wish Mike was around here. So we've covered April 30th that he said he had a secret to whisper in my ear. Of course, I wish Mike was here. So if he's saying that the, the, he didn't admit to a hoax or he's denying everything that we talked about, what was the secret? 
I wish he was here to answer that question. Yeah. I on May first, he mentions this date a lot. That was the date after the uh, the recording. I do end up taking Mike to to dinner. We go to a Thai restaurant in Pine Top, Arizona. Uh, Pine Top is roughly forty ish minutes away from Heber, which is kind of the the central location where this event took place. Anyhow, we're there at, at this restaurant, and I'm asking him. We're talking more about the hoax. I tell him that I'd like to go out to the site. You you both have uh, text messages of me telling him that I don't want to go out to the site on the weekend because I'm afraid of people overhearing us talking about this being a hoax. Can you both affirm that you have seen those as well? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, and he answers in the affirmative that he agrees that we... we can't really have that discussion around a lot, of, a lot of people. Anyhow, so after after uh, we leave from uh, the Thai restaurant, we go to get fuel for my truck. I don't know that this really matters, but there's another text message which these folks have seen where he's asking me to get him things inside of the grocery store. They've seen it. Then uh, we head up to the site. We go immediately to Gentry Lookout Tower first because that is where I was told this event took place. And we are there for roughly 30 minutes. I am shown where the truck was parked in alignment with the trees, in alignment with the tower, and how Mike was involved in, in hyping all these people up. Just on this interview that, you, that y'all just did with him for the first time, I heard him say he didn't even see the UFO. <laughs> That's a huge that's a huge divergence from what he said for the past 45 years. He describes yeah. it as beautiful and all these things. That that was that was interesting. He also said an interesting comment that he had a feeling something was going to happen, so that's why he took off. These are things that that he explained to me in in the the call. You hear him say that him getting out of the truck was all deliberate. It was all a very staged thing. Anyhow, I uh, sorry. Uh, I'm, no, I'm just. No, I'm, said yes. Okay. Okay. I uh, anyhow. So moving forward from that, on June eighth, I emailed a copy of the audio from this re- recording. I uh, to both Travis Walton and Mike Rogers. I uh, the intent of of me doing that was letting them know roughly a month in advance. They're working together, we're going to be releasing this audio. I think that's really important for folks to know. Mike was not taken off guard by this. He knew that this was coming out, and we all collaborated together on its release. I think it's very important. And nowhere along the way, of course, did he mention anything about the call being manipulated. I on June the 9th, and I can show show all of this, of course. I, Travis Walton emailed me back and asked me not to release the audio as it had the very real possibility of destroying his 45 years of hard work. And that's a quote. Well, uh, for the next several days, uh, Travis and I talked about the release of the call, uh, even a two hour phone conversation, which I would happy to supply phone records on that uh, between Travis and I. Uh, it's important to know that Travis and I get along pretty well. Uh, we don't have arguments. We don't talk like Mike and I talk. That's for sure. <laughs> and I, 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 not, I don't have anything bad to say about uh, Travis Walton in, in in terms of his professionalism and us getting along. Anyhow, on June fourteenth, it was the first time I had heard from Mike. I received a, an email from him. Again, no accusations about this being uh, manipulated, false, anything like that. Instead, he's asking what Travis and I are cooking up with the documentary. I uh, Mike let me know that Travis had cut him off and Mike's first I'm going to call them damage control excuses and this is a quote I used the whole thing with you to find out the truth about Travis Walton and I have to some extent perhaps you could show me more of your association with the great Walton that's June 14 on June 18th uh, four days later I, Mike sent me an unsolicited copy of his drug screening because there's been uh, 
a lot of allegations about you know, drug use. And Mike, I'm going to bypass on that because I don't think it's important to talk correct to talk about somebody's medical records, although he did send them to me. Um, also, as part of that email, Mike wrote the following. And this is a quote. The thing you sneakily recorded in which I told you about Travis and I, and he has in bold, possibly talking about a hoax, did not, in capitals, happen before our incident in 1975. It happened two years later in 1977. So when I read that, I say, okay, great. So y'all have hoaxed two events then. <laughs> if that's what you're telling me. This happened in 1977. So I wrote Mac, uh, excuse me, I wrote Mike back calling his bluff. On which event are you telling me you hoax? And are there two? On June 22nd, Mike wrote me back. This is a quote. You claim you're confused about which thing I emailed you about, whether it was in 19, 1975 or 1977. It was 1977, you idiot. In 1977, Travis and I were talking about the skeptics' claims of it being a hoax, not before the encounter. I have now made that very clear. You were only confused because you choose to be. Okay. On June 28th, I sent Mike Rogers and Travis Walton a copy of the transcript of the call to give either of them an opportunity to fix any errors. Neither Mike or Travis uh, cited any errors that they would like fixed, but Mike did tell me the following. Uh, he said, as far as, as far as this may damage Travis Walton, his reputation or future, I don't care. That's in caps. What I do care about is my sister Dana, and he, I'm not gonna go over this because he said a lot of it here on the show, but talking about Travis cheating and all these things. I also, along this same time, Mike starts this whole like tit for tat that he has me on recording saying something very incriminating. I, and he said it here on your show that he has this recording device that he hid in his pocket. Uh, I want to approach this in the most respectful way that I can, but Mike is an older man. He walks with a cane. We're out in the mountains. I was almost holding the guy up because I was afraid where he was going to fall, to be honest. And I, I mean that respectfully. Um, he walks very slow, complained that he was dizzy a lot. This same uh, report in the way that I'm describing was also verified in text message, which the both of you have also seen as well, where he complains that his leg is still hurting him, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, anyhow, while I'm just reading my, my notes here, um, I have repeatedly asked Mike to release this audio. I know he doesn't have it. His story has changed from it being in his pocket to sitting on the dashboard of my truck. This is this is a very childish game of well, you have something, I have something, and it's reminds me of how people act in elementary school, to be honest. He refuses to, to uh, release this audio. He's constantly posting on his Facebook about me that I'm refusing to answer his questions. He's he's coming across as very desperate for for the air to be cleared, I suppose. If he's saying that he has this audio of me and he has audio of the truth, post it. Post it. Don't don't sit here and keep playing this game over and over. I uh, anyhow this continues on and on. I, I don't want to spend too much time and I certainly don't want to be in a position where I, I think that I'm disparaging a client. Right. Um, what's most important to me is, is in, in my job and y'all's job, you can't have somebody saying that you've manipulated their, their, their call right. or their information that is a hundred percent not okay. And uh, it's, it's offensive in the same way that if somebody had made these allegations against you. I have been working with Mike consistently on getting this fixed. And yesterday I, I thought that we had a resolution for that. I I have unfor unfortunately threatened legal action mm -hmm. against Mike. That's why you keep hearing him say no comment. I'm not proud of that. Nobody wants to have to sue a client. It's It's not okay. But 
I still will defend myself as I would expect you to, you both to do as well. Right. Uh, Mike did post a retraction of his accusation about me and about the call. I, Mike will never tell me that the call was manipulated. He'll tell other people, but he won't say that to me. I, this is, this is just, it, it, it feels frustrating here. Um, I'm sure what, what would be really fantastic is if either of you would be willing to, uh, kind of go over your interactions with me, go over the, the interactions with uh, anything that, that you feel that is applicable to discuss. You know, and I, I'll just start. I mean, for me, this, and, and thank you, Scott. <laughs> Scott is, yay, oh, baby. So I, Scott has been uh, in, incredible. And Scott is, it, Scott kind of put this into uh, my thought process because we are coming into the video realm of things. And, and so he told me about the, you know, all the interactions, uh, the, the, the tape recording that you had uh, yeah. with Mike and things. And so I've been in the past couple of days just trying to catch up with right. all of this. And so it's been um, a learning process for me. Um, and, and Scott knows much more about this, but I will say that it, you know, you have been very wonderful about providing everything. You know, I mean, you have, you're, you're saying things. It's not like you're just, saying things to say things without validation you know yeah. which is you know in the ufo field everybody says things and there's no proof and that's just great because people in ufology will believe whatever they're told and then when somebody says oh but the government took away my proof or you know yada 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 right. people actually believe right. it but but they're you know, i don't and, want you guys to believe me i don't want anybody well, we listening have to, this believe. to believe me like you said earlier no. you know earlier it's like there's there's not a question about believing this is this is the way it rolled out here is the proof that's and it. That's so correct. and 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 i think that um and i was really hoping that mike would play the recording that he had of you and i i will reach out to him again and see if you will and again like i said i would love to have a conversation with Travis and, and Mike again, because this is all happening so quickly. But um, yeah, I appreciate I, I appreciate what you have been willing to put forward, Ryan. You're thank welcome. You. You're welcome. And I'm going to say, honestly, I don't really think there is a recording of Ryan. I'm, I don't think that exists. I think Mike is just trying to be defensive and, you know, but one other thing I want to say is that uh, Ryan has been completely open about everything and all the information that he shared with us was just, you know, he was wide open. Any questions I had, he answered me. He gave me all the evidence, you know, things that he wanted me to look at to back up what he was saying and, you know, I can just say that that he's a he's he's a good guy. Thank you. I I appreciate that. I, I love what I do for work, and I, unfortunately, this this show has turned more into an episode of Jerry Springer than a show about um, aliens, UFOs, maybe even how how we put whatever you want, however you want to package this together. I didn't package this as Jerry Springer. No, and I, you, it's, trust me. it's unfortunate. I, and I, I think, you know, that's been the thing. And Ryan, you know, you and I have just talked today for the first time. But I think yes. you know, when you when you follow me on my Odyssey over the past, I mean, over half a decade publicly, it's like I went from, you know, going to UFO conferences and being like, yes, OK, this I, I believe this. And I'm going to these abduction you know clinics and and we all think that the the benevolent space brothers are here and and you know i mean yes. all of all of these things and i mean i went through that process because i was oh my gosh i i, I like to believe the best in people and i will tell you the yeah, UFO you subject yeah. 
uh, has taught me that there is not a lot of good in people in this subject, except for the people that, that have found me and that listen to the show. But it, yeah. it, it's um, this field is rife for the taking, and as a result, that's what we've we've seen. We haven't. Yeah. We're not making steps forward. We're taking fifty steps no. back. We get something. Well, in it's the because we have a lot of it. stories. It's because there's a lot of stories like this. Respectfully, there's a lot of stories like this. Yeah, Mike loves to. He loves to call me a would-be skeptic. He loves to call me a nobody. He loves to do all these things. It's okay. I, that's okay, but I am not those things, but he's entitled to his opinion. He, he certainly loved to spend time with me as you have also seen in text where he tells me how much he enjoys me. Anyhow, uh, well, no, he enjoyed me a lot until he was cut is the truth. Well, and I think but, it was interesting though that he, you know, and I, I loved, honestly, I really liked to hear his stories about Phil class and some of the interactions that you know that that he had and i i think that is it, it's it's all so fascinating and yeah can um, i tell you guys a, a quick story to yeah, to wrap yeah. this up all right so as part of putting this together i and this was before i met mike this is a year ago or so i had been uh, working with i'm going to use a very ambiguous term intentionally the cast the crew on on getting i uh, the content, getting film, aerial uh, footage of the site, all of these things. And it was it was really tricky for, for me to get that because I was still new to, to the crew, or I'm going to keep using that word, the crew, intentionally. And uh, anyhow, I was finally able to get the, the actual coordinates of where this allegedly took place. And I went up the same way these guys went to work. It's a it's a beautiful, beautiful area. There's wild horses running around, tall trees. It's green. I mean, it looks like something out of a postcard. It's just gorgeous. Anyhow, I'm driving up, and I go to the site, and I'm taking a lot of uh, pictures, a lot of which I've shared with the both of you, and um, and you're welcome to use if you'd like. But I, uh, anyhow. I had a, a vehicle that probably shouldn't have been up there is, it, is the truth. And um, I, I called Travis from the, up. Oh, there we go. I slipped up. I called the crew from, <laughs> that was bad. I called the crew from the, the site and I said, I need a different way to get out of here. Like I, this is going to break my, my vehicle. And uh, so I'm saying, What's a better way? Anyhow, long story short, I, I'm told a different way to go home, which is Highway uh, 300, Rim Road, and go that way, then then go to Highway 260. So I do. I, I'm driving along. Rim Road is a is a graded road by the Forest Service. I uh, they have these things called water bars, which you hear Mike mention in there. It's going over them, like yeah. jump them. They're made so the road doesn't wash out in storms. Anyhow, I. I come around this corner. All of our stories are the same to this point. Coming around a corner and we see something. And I do. And I run above the tree line. I see a damn UFO. And I think, here everybody has these phones in their pocket, but there's no good footage. And I think, here we go, screw these guys. I'm going to get my own <laughs> UFO footage here. And so I, I get my phone and I, I zoom in to it just hovering above this tree line to, to get great footage. And I realize it's a lookout tower. And it was from that point forward, I realized how this story was done, which was later confirmed. So that that in, in passing, or in closing, I, I should say, I, I'm not, I, I, I'm not a skeptic in the sense of, of what these people would like you to believe about me. My job is to ask questions. Y'all's job is to ask questions. And that is the definition of a skeptic, is somebody that asks questions and not go on blind faith. And, and, and I, wanted, I wanted this story to be real. I really did. And um, as I saw in a, in a comment here earlier, 
that uh, I, I think I, I, I think the comments is something to the effect telling about how it was hoaxed and not 45 years of keeping it alive would be much more profitable. And I can agree with that comment. I mean, I think, you know, for, for all of us, you know, and I know, I mean, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm, I mean, this is going to take a while for me to take all of this in. And I, I think when, you know, I talked to Scott and things have been happening over the past 24 hours. It's like, um, holy crap, you know, you, yeah. you want to, yeah. it, <laughs> at some point in time, you want to just have that faith that what yeah. we're being told is correct. And, and, um, we do everybody, everybody, nobody wants to be lied to. And as you said in your closing, you did that really well, by the way. But what you said was exactly on the money, for sure. And I, I appreciated what you said. And it's, it's, it feels frustrating, but yeah. it's, it's okay. That's okay. So um, I'm open to any, any questions that you guys would like to ask. If anybody in your audience, I, I don't, I, as you guys know, I don't have anything to hide. I, I will respect the terms of my contracts. I, I want to make that really clear, but I I will do my best if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. I yeah, I have one about the call or whatever they want to say. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I don't think, I, and you know, I don't know if you can answer it or not. But so, how did Travis react? I don't want to talk about anything, Travis. This, Travis, that. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Okay, no problem. And so I have to ask you, Ryan, like, what is, where are you going from here? Because this, it seems um, like everything that's happened since April and I mean, it, well, since you began. This is my, this... this is my, my biggest fear. Um, my biggest fear is what everybody saw just happen. I'm, I'm putting a, a lot of time, a lot of effort. It costs a network a tremendous amount of money to put something like this together and then have the crew say, oh, that was manipulated. Uh, or that we didn't, that's not what this was about. Or you guys made it look like we did this. That's my, that's my fear. On, on a different token, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the UFO community. And um, I, I don't like that folks have placed a lot of weight in any story. Um, I, I like people to, I would like to be able to create content that, that people can see that's not slanted, that's not jaded, that that's very direct, the way that I have interacted with you folks. And for people to come up with their own decisions, I don't think anybody has the right to tell anybody how to believe. Right. What? Then you are not a part of the UFO community. Get out, Buster. Guilty. Guilty. I know. Praise the Lord, sweet baby oh. Joseph. And, and yeah, and, and, I, and I do, you know, I've talked about this before. I mean, it, it's like we do get into this subject, and it's like you just, you have a sighting, and then you want to go, you turn to these gods, gods and goddesses of you yeah. who at the end of the day, when you look into their backgrounds, they're not truthful about their backgrounds and yet people are still holding them up in high regard or you've got yeah. somebody who is involved in um a ufo hoax that is contributed to uh the mental demise of a person paul benowitz yeah you know and and things like that and so people have been this isn't this is um for me people are being hurt this isn't uh yeah i i really feel you know and, and i knowing going through what i've gone through i've i've been through hell and i yes. think that it's just not at some point in time you know like i said um at the closing of the show <laughs> before you came on it's like at some point in time we have to to stand up and say look i mean this is you know we we are looking to these gods for disclosure we are looking right. at the same yeah. bullshit brokers that have said we're giving you disclosure 
for 50 years and they have done nothing but profit from this. They have done nothing yes. but steer the narrative. They have done nothing but, um, you know, dangle a carrot over here when we should be looking over here. And that is Correct. wrong. And so yes. I see, you know, all of these patriots that are whooping it up, you know, and following some of the, the narratives that are going on that really have nothing to do with the pure and honest search for uh, facts for yes. uh, ufology, I mean, for the phenomenon. And I, I look at the way that we blindly follow people without questioning. And, yeah. you know, that that I think that is a lesson that we've all learned. We've all followed people because this initial story seems so appealing. And it's like, oh, my gosh, that really happened. Yeah. And then we peel back the layers and then we make a painful discovery. And then at the end of the day, you still sit back and you watch the fans uh the the cult members that are going to say oh no no we're going to get on social media and bully you because you're wrong and you're lying about this this can't be true and the government put yes. you up to this you're a black you know you're i mean you're obviously working for the the dark cabal which actually i just want to say this is kind of funny i i was accused by um what was it Corey uh good and david wilcox of being a member of the the dark cabal Oh my God! Wearing that one proudly, I mean seriously. Yeah. If I, wearing you know wearing that flag because I'm actually exposing the truth is is yeah. I mean putting little Lord yeah. Fauntleroy and his crew on notice. Then I suppose you know bring it on. But it that is um, it is uh, quite staggering. And and I I will say that I think tonight has been historical on multiple fronts. Uh, I mean right. I mean. Yeah, Ryan, I can't thank you enough. So, what, Ryan, what are you going to do? What? I mean, where, where do you, where do you go? What are you going to do? What's your next step? Um. So I really, I really like Robert Schaefer, quite a bit. Um, I like people that that don't just spout stuff, but they have a, a, a I don't have to agree with with Schaefer, and sometimes I don't. But I like that he has confidence. I would I would like to continue to work with him on on putting together I uh, and finishing this project. I, I I don't know that I'm going to have a network support in this. It's very risky, and there's there's other issues which I I have discussed with both of you that that could be a, a major problem in in proceeding, but. I would like to find a way to uh, tell this story within the bounds in which I can. Yeah. Do you I'd like to see that? I mean, do you do you get the impression that maybe the people that we've talked about tonight that are involved in the story would ever um, talk about this with you or say, "Hey, this is." They have. But I mean, on on the record, and I mean, would they come forward about this? my checkbook was big enough. <laughs> so I don't know how else to say it besides that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, and so you, uh, I mean, you had mentioned that you didn't blame, I mean, like when this first happened and there was the national Enquirer, you know, there was the, the, the bounty, the prize, for this, I mean, sure. you saw this this group of people that you felt was, I mean, it's like okay, they're you know they're they're on the writing the, the Betty and Barney Hill thing, and this is right. you know kind of sexy and exciting, and let's see what's going to happen. And they um, didn't necessarily think that it would go this far. I, I think that's very safe for for anybody that's just out to win a a prize. For sure, I, I, you're you're putting together uh, something with your eye on on the prize. Literally, I don't think that anybody could have predicted that we would be where we are today. I don't think that Mike, if you would have asked him 45 years ago, would he be on a podcast speaking to you? I don't. The, the my my opinion is that um, this was a, an innocent. A tactic to win money with a magazine that doesn't really have the best reputation for telling the truth anyway. 
I don't think anybody would dispute that. The Inquirer, that uh, <laughs> Hillary doesn't have three that, heads and an alien baby. What the right? Okay. But I it, that that is my opinion. That is my takeaway. That this was a, a very innocent. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how to say it. It, it was a. It was an attempt to win a prize and a lot of money with that. That was it. I, I don't see anything above and beyond that. I really don't. I, I, I think that it grew legs and the, the legs that it grew were unanticipated. I agree. I, I do not believe that any of these guys went and attempted to perpetrate a hoax on America, on the world to ufologists. I, I do feel bad for the, for the, for the witnesses, I guess you could call them, that were in the truck, uh, this has destroyed a lot of their lives. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's important to know as well that uh, Steve Pierce has no problem calling Travis a liar. He's <laughs> said it publicly many times. He thinks that this was a black ops uh, event from Area 51. Uh, Ken Peterson also doesn't believe Travis at all he he takes his own approach this was a religious event about the the phoenix rising you travis being the phoenix i i did more like a religious overtone okay i don't know much about that i don't know about the phoenix rising story i don't know that's a question uh, to ask him hmm. um dallas i i'm steve steve pierce alleges that dallas agreed with him on this black ops thing so really at the, the end of the day the only people that believe in the story are the ones that were involved in its creation and yeah. even then it sounds like they've had you know a wavering of <laughs> well here here's something that that mike told me and i can say this that I, don't, I don't care one of the complaints that he told me about about travis and i i agreed with him is he said look travis puts all of his the weight of this story, there's two things you hear about this story. What about all the witnesses and what about the lie detector test? That's what people know about this story. So the witnesses keep the boat afloat, if you could say. And uh, as a result, Mike has no problem telling anybody that he, del he believes he deserves a portion of the cut. Because if there was no witnesses, take witnesses out of the picture, what do you have left? You have Betty and Barney Hill that had no witnesses and that was one of their biggest complaints or biggest not complaint but uh attacks i suppose you could say yeah wow uh, i yeah. so it might might you told me like we don't we don't have anything there is no story without me without the other guys and he's right he's right to that um travis has come out and publicly said about this 35 percent that you hear mike say as part of that, if Mike, like any business, if you're going to get 35%, then you also have to help pay for the books. You have to help pay for me to go to the shows to sell the books. You have to pay for everything involved in the production of the business. You don't just get a 35% handout. Travis has said that many times, and he's right. He's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what do you think is going to happen? It's just, it's a mess. I'm telling you. It's like, this it is, is like Jerry Springer. Oh, I, it's like, we need Lord. a. We even have DNA tests to go along now. Oh. I mean, it, it is right off of Jerry Springer. I, it's, it's not what I thought that, that I was getting involved in this black ops thing. And yeah. I mean, think about it. If you have people from Area 51 is right by Vegas. If you're going to go steal people to, to do experiments, take some drunk people off the strip in Vegas. Don't fly in some homemade <laughs> UFO to the middle of the forest and take some loggers that have witnesses like if you're gonna if you're gonna take somebody take somebody that doesn't have a witness <laughs> about six yeah like it just uh, it doesn't and, and why would other humans that work at area 51 want to do tests on other humans unless of course they're alleging that there's a bunch of aliens inside area 51 that are running around stealing people well, oh. I think we've heard that narrative before from certain yeah. people that I've talked about on the show, but I've got to just ask you because Jeff asked this question in chat and he just said, what yeah, about sure. uh, when they were being interrogated and facing murder charges? Would oh, yeah, that's super easy. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. I don't no, mean no, to interrupt. No, go no, ahead, no. Please. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, so wouldn't they have admitted that it was a hoax then? So if it's, I'm going to read. I'm going to read you guys the four questions they were asked because I don't. I don't know that anybody has has seen this. So let me pull those up. I have here on my computer. I have. You have. Okay. I I should rephrase that. A lot or most have not read those questions. Hold on. Yes. There was only four questions. It's not some like drawn out polygraph thing, or at least how I think of a polygraph being there in there for only, hours and hours. Yeah, and there was only one question that was relevant to the situation. That's correct. Yeah. So let me let me pull this up here and I'll 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 read this. All right, these are these are the questions verbatim. Um oops, sorry, that was a the polygraph that Travis failed with John McCarthy. Uh, hold on. Those were his, the questions there were obviously directed at UFOs. Let me get the ones that the other guys were asked. Sorry, I'm going through a, a PDF that has hundreds of pages. All right, here's the four questions. So number one, and again, this is word for word. Did you cause Travis Walton any serious physical injury last Wednesday afternoon? No. Easy. Do you know if Travis Walton was physically injured by some other member of your work crew last Wednesday? Not a very hard question. <laughs> question number three. Do you know if Travis Walton's body is buried or hidden somewhere in that Turkey Springs area? Okay. Not that hard. The last question. Did you tell the truth about actually seeing a UFO last Wednesday when Travis Walton disappeared? Yep. Let's focus on that. UFO, by definition, is an object they can't identify. They're seeing an object through the trees by their own admission. It has been initially thought to be a campfire by their own admission, a light that they cannot make out by their own admission. And now Mike's saying that he didn't even see the thing at all, just had a, a, a hunch that something was going to happen. So they all drove off. These guys are in a truck uh, looking through trees, regardless if you want to believe in gentry. Maybe you want to believe in a paper mache balloon. A lot of people believe in that. If you want to believe it was a UFO, believe in that. Either way, you're looking through a bunch of trees and uh, you're looking uphill. <laughs> so did you see something that you weren't able to identify? Yeah. The question does not read or do any of these questions read, was Travis Walton abducted by aliens? Right. This is what people want the polygraph to say. So to answer, to answer your question, I believe it was Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, I, yes. about this, this polygraph why they were not interrogated on murder charges. I wouldn't think that that's an interrogation on, on murder charges. The other thing that's really important to realize is they signed up for this on their own. That you heard Mike say that on this interview tonight. They asked for the polygraph. They went to the police. Right. This is creating a fantastic storyboard. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope, Jeff, that if that answers your question, I can't see the chat here. So I, I, I have another question. So yeah, go. is, do you have any idea if, uh, if Bruce knows about this, what's going on? Did you say Bruce? Do you, um, um, I don't know, Bruce. Pierce. Steve Pierce? Steve Pierce. I'm sorry. He goes by Bruce sometimes. Oh, okay. Does yeah. he know what's going yeah. on in, in what sense? Does he know about the phone call and about, you know, maybe the possibility that he's actually been fooled too? Oh, yeah. So he's commented on my my YouTube uh, video there, the confession. He's unfortunately since deleted his comments, which I don't know why. But he 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 thinks that um, there this was all this black ops thing he doesn't believe in the event as told so any conversation about ufos or staged ufos that's not gonna my my takeaways that's not gonna enter his consciousness right because he's he's on such a different page anyway right he, okay. he clearly is but he's good. still showing up at all the conferences 
Yeah. Yeah, he, he did post, I, I hope it's still there on my on my video, that he doesn't think there's such thing as aliens or greys or any of this. And, okay, uh, that's fine. I don't know if I do either, but I wouldn't post that there's not because I, I think it's pretty disingenuous to go to UFO alien conferences and also not believe in them. Like, you shouldn't profit from those events if that's the case. Yeah, right. And so let me ask you, and, um, and I appreciate your patience, and sorry about my squeaky yeah. chair here, but um, so I want to ask you about, you know, when Travis was missing and there, you know, they, I mean, first of all, this is interesting. It should have been about a man that's missing. And then how yeah. quickly did the UFO thing come into that while he was missing? Oh, thanks for, who thanks for asking that. Players? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks. That's a good one. So I'm when any of us in life make a, a judgment, we're going to base it off of our own life and our own life experiences and what we would do. So that's how I'm going to answer your question. If my brother had disappeared out in the woods, even if I did think that it was a UFO, the last thing I would do is call into UFO centers and start pitching a story. And that is exactly what we have. New Fork, which stands for National UFO Reporting Center, run by Peter Davenport, on their website, they have a series of phone calls of Travis's family members calling in to pitch this story while he is allegedly maybe murdered, maybe in a UFO, maybe who knows what got him. I, Me, that's not something that I would do. I don't think that's what most people would do. No. Uh, you, these calls are all public on the New Fork website. Um, I think I think folks should listen to them. There's no concern over where he is. There's no nothing. In fact, Dwayne is on record saying, "Oh, the aliens will bring him back." Not these exact words, but "Oh, they'll bring him back. They're nice people, nice aliens." I think whatever. I think Travis's mother said the same thing. Something like that. Yeah, he wasn't worried yeah. about it that he would be brought back. And so, let me just ask yeah. you though. I mean, was you know was there an attempt to manipulate that group of people i mean could there have been you know because we've we've seen that there are specific players that insert themselves into a narrative i don't think and, so and they you know manipulate the whole it's like a psyop you know they go in. i don't they, believe so okay my 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 takeaway is just simply building a storyboard to win an award from a from a, a rack magazine yeah it's a, I, I really think it was as simple as that. I don't. I and I really don't believe they were going out to do anything nefarious. Your your opinion on hoaxing National Enquirer is up to everybody to decide on their own. But my takeaway is that's all this ever was. Yep, I agree. And so, did I mean? Do you know of you know with any anybody that was involved in this early on? I mean, have you heard about people that are regretting their decisions or has everything been pretty quiet except for the the key players that have been promoting the story i've i've never heard i anybody show any any guilt or no if that is that what you're asking me do they regret yeah, I mean, I doing guess, this no okay. no because you see them probably holding up their their reward checks okay. no and if they if they did, I, I anybody that feels guilt, I would hope that they would have the conscience not to continue. I would hope, but everybody's got a different moral compass. I, I don't know. Right. And so let me ask you. There's a question in chat and again. Thank yeah. you all for hanging in here. I, I, this this is going to be one for the memory books. Um, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's talk about the the radiation and the tree. The tree code. Yeah, so I sent you those. Is there a way you can screen share on this thing? Do you know? Yeah, you know what? I am so completely special when it comes to this, and this is my. First. I'm gonna hit this button here that says screen share, and let's see what happens. All right, if I if it drops me, then just I'll come back. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, video. Oh, screen share. All right, hold on. Let me close some stuff here. On okay, my I know, and I'm so sorry <laughs> that I'm. I should That's okay. know this. And I'm not prepared. To... As you guys know, I'm not prepared for this interview at all, but that's all right. No. <laughs> all right. If you it, if you don't mind, I'm going to get some stuff to, to show. Give me a second just to organize my desktop, if that would be all right. Uh, 
Oh, it's been one heck of a show. I'm going to sleep for the next 20 okay. days. I think. <laughs> All right. Here we, here we go. Okay. Um, gosh. Well, you guys get to see my entire screen here. All right. Here we go. I uh, sharing is two monitors. So I agree that I am sharing my entire screen to the world. Okay. You ready? Ready. Uh, Chrome would like to record this computer screen. One second. Hold on. It's asking me to verify my password and all that to do this. Well, this is the real excitement. As it's all right, I'm getting a pop up here from Google Chrome. It says Google Chrome will not be able to read record the contents of your screen until you close the app and restart. Um, I'm going to hit later and let's see what happens. Okay. It's asking me choose what to share the entire screen. Share. I. So it looks like what it's done in that in your guys's app is it's created like a second window like there's somebody else joined in on the show. Mamma mia. See, that's what it did to me too when I tried to do it. This is real action <laughs> as it happens right here. <laughs> <laughs> I see myself. It's like I have two, like I'm in here twice almost. I, it's like you guys need to add like there was a fourth participant here in the in the uh, show. Um, let's see. Let's see if this. Oh dear! Nope, that's not gonna happen. Hmm. What if I what if I cancel out of this and then we just have the one that's my my screen? Yeah, that would be. Problem is, I don't know if you can hear me talk. Yeah. Now I'm completely, oh, Lord, baby Joseph and all the holy people. Okay. Well, I just don't even know what to say. Let me send you guys a, a screenshot of what I, what I see here. Hold on. Clearly, I will be doing some, Scott and I are going to be doing some tutorials. Yes. All right. This is this is what I see from my end. I'm just sending this to you, Scott. It's on its way. Okay. Did you get that? Yes. Do you okay, see how it go. has here like a? Go. Oh wait, I think that just worked. Ooh, Sweet let me close all my text messages show. there. I know. I'm like oh, <laughs> mother of mother of pearl. Right. What are we gonna see <laughs> on there? Okay. Um. How do I minimize this? See, we're we're in a learning process together. This is this is there a special go. moment. Wow! Yeah, uh, it's, it's repeating everything. I'm trying to get out of full screen. There we go. Well, you ask the people or the people that are still here in the video, can you guys see, can you guys see my screen or are we just kicking tires here? No, I think we, I mean, I can see your screen. Yeah, I can see. I can see it. Yep. So you guys can see I have the, the chat thing here. I'll, All right. What it looks like is I can still see this on the TV over there. It looks like a kaleidoscope or like some just mirrors headed in and more and more and more. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. There we go. That's how we want it. All right, cool. So you guys can see my screen. All right. Yep. So I'm going to minimize yep. that. I want to be really clear. Everything in this folder has to do with the story, but I, as you can see here, nothing is named. I, oh, I think I saw in the comments somebody asking what a light tower looks like at night. There you go. I, this is not Gentry, but it's the same model. I <laughs> this is at the the phone booth with these little aliens. There's a guy across the street that has a woodworking shop that he makes all these aliens. Heber is like a miniature Roswell. 
and you have all this alien stuff. There's this alien community there. These little alien dudes are extremely expensive. That guy, he's probably like four feet tall. I want to say they're like seven hundred dollars. It's no joke. Wow, a lot of well, a lot of money to be made off carving aliens. I well, clearly will get on this, it. This one has a little COVID mask. I. These are just the phone booths. Here's a guy across the street where he has this little alien fortress, I guess. I don't know. Good for him for working it, you know? <laughs> All right. I'm going to see if this video will play, if the bandwidth do it. But this is aerial footage. This is what Rim Road looks like out there for people that are curious how it looks. Just a fairly... This is all B-roll footage that I had, had collected for this. Eh. Here, well, let's go to the next. So next. this is... Um, this is... Can you guys see my mouse on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is Rim Road right here. This is headed west. I... This is the corner that everybody talks about because when you're down there in your vehicle, you're blocked by trees. And if you really have microscopic eyes, you can see gentry right there. Let's play this. Oh, this is, okay, this is even better. This is the corner right here. And I, that's where my mouse is circling. That's gentry right there hovering above the tree line. So let's play this here. Let's see if I can make it full screen. Let's see what happens. Is that showing up full screen for you guys? Yes. Yep. Yeah. All right. So if I pause it here, so this is still, this is Rim Road, Highway 300. You can see it's a, it's a nice road. It's paved, or not paved, but um, graded really well. Yep. Do you see Gentry right there poking its head up over the top of the tree line? Yep. All right. This is, this is not me. I wish I had one of those. But this, I guess, can kind of give you, and that's a Polaris Razor side-by-side. -side. They're smaller than a car, but you can kind of get a size reference off of that. And this right here, again, that's the that's the corner that everybody talks about going around a corner. And just for the record, I, I want to be on the record to clarify this. I, I want to present this as my theory, just right. so I'm within the bounds of where I should be. I, I really want to make that clear that um, I'm not alleging that anybody told me this. This is my theory and people can take that how they want. Okay. So even still here, keep in mind, this is aerial. I would say my drone here is about, uh, I don't know, 100 feet, 125 feet up. You still can't see the stilts here for the tower. If you're down down here where my mouse is and you're down there in the in the tree line you definitely the only thing you're seeing is at this point lights cover or lighting up the the uh the forest there right and that's also really important sorry that's why i sent you that simulated photo that i created today yeah because i good because i wanted to get an idea of how that would look yeah uh, so it's important to know that, you, like, where my mouse is right here, that's a solar panel. There's all these antennas. None of that was there uh, in the 70s at all. I also think it's really important to recognize, and I'll, I'll play the footage here again, but this is a campground down below. And I think it's important to recognize the guys initially thought that they were seeing the lights of hunters at a campground. Oh, okay. Which is exactly what they would have scene per my theory I, i'm just for the record i'm going to keep saying my theory because i don't feel like getting in kind of trouble right <laughs> <Too late. laughs> no i'm kidding i'm kidding anyhow so just doing a little flyover oh, that is incredible fly over there uh so let me play that one more time you you can see how close even at a hundred something feet up i uh, how close i have to be to even see the stilts holding this up, I still can't. Right. It's also important to know. So there's a there's a uh, a girl that goes by the name Charlie Weiser. I really like her a lot. She's been just great to to kind of 
talk about our my theory here and she put together a uh, a great website but she has next to the next to gentry tower she has the statements of how people are describing the, the witnesses are describing the ufo saying it's glass all around they can see the window frames holding it up they have the top to the bottom like a, like a pie shell holding it together yep. that it's metal that it has yellow lights yellow lights is really important because they're halogen it's also really important to know, and I'll show this as part of the, the evidence here, I suppose. These things have big spotlights that shine down on them with colored lenses on them, one of which is blue. I, all right, let's go to the next. Uh, this is a still image, of course, here. Now you can see the tower a lot more, or excuse me, the stilts a lot more. This is Rim Road right here where I'm drawing my mouse. This is an unnamed road. There's not named on, on Google, at least. So this is just showing you a slightly different perspective. Of course, here you can definitely see the, the stilts, but this is not the direction of travel. This is me just trying to get shots all around the tower. Right. Uh, let's see what we have next here. Here's another aerial shot. Uh, this is Rim Road right here. I Oh, I can, that's, okay, cool, let's do that. So, oh, whoops. This right here, that's the corner in question. What I, what I, I'm, what my theory tells me is <laughs> this is where the, the truck was parked, according to my theory. And with the truck parked there, you're having a line of sight through the, through the trees where you cannot see the, the stilts at all. The only thing you can see is a hovering craft that matches the dimensions by feet and width and height, exactly as described in, in the book. Yep. Uh, this is just a wider, a wider shot of the area out there. Uh, here's a, a closer shot of it. Now here, for all the people that have watched my, my confession video with Mike, I want you all to know this was the background and nobody, nobody saw that. And I, I feel kind of disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, in the, in the video right here, that's a picture of, a, I think Mike or Travis. Oh, shoot. Dang it. I'm sorry. Oh, let me get that back. Anyhow, right on this side over here, that's a picture of Mike and Travis or either Mike or Travis over here. And the opacity of this is fairly low, but I left that in there as, as a clue. The only person who, who picked up on that was Charlie, so I guess she wins the award. <laughs> uh, here's a, a closer shot of it. So here's something else that's that's really important. The shift of the, of the, the guys or girls that work in these towers is five days. They work five days on, they have two days off. Five days on, two days off. Five is an important number in this story. So, and why don't you explain your your theory, theory? about yeah about that five days and what that's attached to? So, my my theory says that this is where Travis stayed was in this tower. Uh, this tower is a, a far enough distance; it's five miles from where they would publicly say that the event happened. Um, but yeah, you're staying in this tower. That's what that's what my theory says. I'm trying to be careful with what I say here. That's what my theory says. So, just for the audience, when they brought them back to search for Travis, they went mm -hmm. to a completely different area. Yeah, so I can show you a map of of that. Um. Let's see, how can I pull that up? Okay, hold on. I'm trying to think how I can pull this up without showing other things at the same time. I'm sorry, I don't mean for you guys to think I'm sitting here trying to be secretive or anything or not. No, show. no, no, no. I'm no, just no, trying no. to respect I, I the terms. You. No, I don't blame you. No. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate everything you've done. Okay, so let's, let's go here. This is a map. Uh, this is just straight from Google. 
Um, I want to make sure I don't have any exacting coordinates on here because I do want to respect the privacy of the site. I don't think I do. So this up here, this is the town of Heber. And what I've done here just on, on Google Maps is I've typed in the directions from Heber. You can see they're just going to the center of the town to I, the work site, we'll call it. I, and there's three ways to go. This is the way that I was told to go right here. You can see that Google says it will take 41 minutes, 16 and a half miles. I want to be really clear. This is a dirt road, off-roading road made for Jeeps, really. It's not graded. It has pretty steep inclines. Uh, I'm saying over here that the average speed, five to eight miles an hour, is accurate. It's it's a bumpy off-road made for Polaris Razors for people that are that are familiar with what what the ATVs, four wheelers. Uh, this is the way to go. And Mike Mike says that himself. He wish he had a four wheel drive truck, and I don't blame him. Uh, this is the typical way to work. I uh, this is the way that they went home and Erica, thanks for asking. Was that the first night that, that you guys had worked late? That is the testimony of many of the, the folks that night. I would felt unfortunate that Mike didn't do that. But then again, he went, said he wanted to go to his log of, you know, times. And I doubt we'll be hearing that, but this is the way that I was told that they went home. I, uh, so here, the arrow Turkey Springs work site, I, uh, this is where the gentry tower is so going this way you can see right here on google it's tw call it 26 miles 25 point on call it 26. i uh, but the major difference here you guys saw what rim road looked like in some of the other other uh, photographs you can go 50 on that pretty easily as opposed to five to eight miles an hour the other way which would be somewhere through here so you're just hauling through here really easily. This is a paved highway, Highway 260, it's a four-lane highway. So yes, it's longer, but Google is saying 45 minutes. I, I say more half an hour. I uh, and it's an easier way home. You're not bouncing in the car. It's just a smooth shot. So uh, I. Can I just ask yeah, you really ahead. quickly, and I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I mean, no. I mean, these, these guys were out there in the field. Wouldn't they know what this this type of thing would look like? Sure. So let's do let's do this. Let's go to maps. Oh, you guys can read my text now too. Jeez, this is really <laughs> invasive. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's all right. I volunteered to do it. All right. So let's pull up the town of Heber right here. Then let's go to where Snowflake is so people can see this on a, on a map. Snowflake is up over here. So the way that if you guys can follow my mouse here, the way that they would go um, is in between these sets of hearts here. And I know that people are going to try to pause when I click on the coordinates there. I would just appreciate that you guys respect that Travis wants to keep this stuff private. Yeah. Because I, I know that I'm not doing the best job here. I just ask people to be respectful. Um, I'm not out here to trash anybody. Anyhow, so I, this, this is going to be the, we'll call it the, the, as the crow flies, that's the way that they would typically go to work. When you're used to going this way and you're only the only reason these guys are in these mountains is to work so it's not like they're out there exploring adventuring they go there to go to work so let's be really clear on that i uh, and if they're always being driven by mike let's also be clear on that and they live way the heck over here so right. let's be clear clear on that too so i think the question that you're trying to answer or ask me erica is if these guys are working in this area, wouldn't they have seen that before? Is that what you're asking me, basically? Yeah, you know, I, yes, and yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, I'm gonna tell you that if that was the the thought process of the, the folks involved with my theory, then then it wouldn't have worked. 
and that was chosen for a reason because it was safe per my theory i it's also important to know these guys would have no reason to be in this area outside of work all right thank you i also want to make it clear that i love the outdoors i i spend a ton of time outdoors i mean here i'm sitting in an rv i'm in new mexico at the moment because i came out here to, to watch the launch of the um richard branson virgin atlantic uh, it took place right here it was pretty cool anyway i i have seen a ton of of lookout towers myself and i i want to make it really clear like, i work in media my job is to pay attention to things i thought that was a ufo myself like i, w I was ready to quit out on on working with the, this crew and have my own abduction i they fooled me <laughs> And in that's hindsight, all, that's all aren't you glad that you didn't me. do that? Because I'm, I'm telling you, getting abducted clearly is not the way to go with this crowd. But Well, if I could talk to somebody that actually was, I don't know, make, make my own opinion on that. Anyhow, um, <laughs> so, yeah, th that that would be the way to, to go to work. Now, I know there's other people that have tried to reverse engineer the, the book. All these little white lines you see here, these are all forest roads. So I want to make it really clear. There's probably a hundred ways to get to where you want to go. Um, but for people that are, I call them Google app, Google Maps warrior, they've never been here. They don't know what this stuff looks like. And sure, you can sit around and draw little lines on a map and say, that's the way they went. And less people come here, it, it doesn't really matter. Right. And, that, and that's the interesting thing that I see with this Skinwalker Ranch page. You see all these. Yeah. You know, which yeah. I understand that people, they can't get there. And so they're doing their best and they're trying to get on and, and, and do the best they can. Right. I, I also want to want to point out that you hear, you heard Mike multiple times on the interview tonight tell you that they were on Rim Road. Yes. Yeah. But that's not the, uh, that, that's. I'm not gonna i'm gonna stop all right so here is from the the work site to gentry it's just basically straight along 300 uh it's 4.9 miles away i some people will say well that's too far away I, no because this is the way home you drive if you go home the shortcut which is shorter by time which was the first time i'm told that they went this way my theory says that, excuse me. I know it's getting annoying. But um, th this would be how that how that would play out. Here is oops. Here is a screenshot of oops, let's see what's going on here. Oh, with uh, a gentry right there. So let me zoom in. You can you see it just perfectly right. sitting there on top of the tree line. And, and the interesting thing, and I just want to say this, excuse me for, again for interrupting you. Yeah. But I can't, I mean, I, I, over the years, I've had so many people that have come to me and have talked about seeing being out in the wilderness and seeing structured craft that it looked like there was scaffolding. Yeah. You know, and, and wow. Here you go. I just pulling up these questions in case anybody has anything they'd like to say i'm sorry for not paying attention no no no. you're doing and, a great job with everything um let me zoom back out here so here again rim road headed west they always tell everybody they're headed west so again that's another shot of gentry just sitting there hovering i uh, here's a, a great <laughs> slide i guess this is what i was trying to explain before um, I know people are probably going to screenshot your video and everything else. I, I knew that before I put this up. So have at it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's what the towers look like on the inside. They're basically just like a studio apartment. There's a, a line in, in Fire in the Sky where they talk about there's a chair in the middle of the room or something in the middle of the room. And if you stand there, there's all these controls and... <laughs> You can turn and look out 360 degree views of the the stars. I mean, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, I'm going to pass the next slide because there's information on there that I would prefer not to uh, have show. Um, this is the site where 
where the uh, this is what they call the abduction site. Um, this is Rim Road right here. This is headed west. I, let me see. I don't want that on there. Anyhow, this here is the old forest road that they would have made uh, going to work. It just goes right along this slight ridge here where the arrow is pointing, old logging road. This here is where, this is how it, the event is described to, um, I don't know how to say it. This is the other site. This is the one that, that, that they say where it all happens, I guess. Right. Anyhow, this is this is the road. You can see here, this is just shot with my drone, but you guys can see this is a pretty steep incline here. So if the truck is down here, you can gauge height based off these trees. I would estimate these trees to be uh, 20, 30, 40 feet tall. Um, if you're driving along here and this is steep and you have trees here, you wouldn't be able to see the UFO up there anyway. If I'm not mistaken, the original description was pretty small. On the, on the Joe Rogan show with Travis, he even describes it as uh, smaller than the room they were sitting in for that interview. So yeah. you wouldn't be able to see anything up there anyway. But that's just my opinion. Um, but this is this is the site where they where they say this happened. Uh, the next slide is just a bigger aerial shot of it. I, I did find it interesting that they're picking this this uh, ridge line right here because it's really the only one in the area. You see, it's all pretty flat. Um, but you can still see that the 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 work of cutting down the trees out there. What they were doing, I call it like zebra striping, is you're basically cutting stripes in there. So it's, say a fire started over here. It, it doesn't have as much fuel to go burn down. I didn't know that people were doing that. Okay. Now, here, here's a here's a thing that I want to point out, and I hope this person doesn't mind that I'm going to use their name, at least their their screen name, but they have used the screen name quite a bit. His name is Robert Lee. What what he says, assuming that that's the male with that name, I have no idea. But this road right here, can you guys see that? This road over here, yeah, that that's what's called Old Verde Road. So what Robert Lee uh, theorizes is, and the work site, by the way, is right here, right down here. Do you see where the mouse is? Yep. What Robert Lee theorizes is that the guys traveled on uh, Old Verde Road. I've always been, I already know that's not true, but the biggest reason why is Robert, if you're watching. <laughs> They don't have a way to get over there. Yeah. This 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 is this is a canyon right here. And this is what happens when people use Google Maps to try to figure things out to, to respectfully fit your theory, Robert. Uh, you can't get over there. This is a forest. This is a canyon. I uh, I don't mean to call you out, but I mean since I saw the road. <laughs> I let's go back to and, and let me just say uh, that you have been here. Yeah. You have been here. Yeah, you I shot been, these all myself. I mean, and they're incredible photos. And, and it's so yeah. you, you have done your due diligence and then some. Well, I, this is what I, respectfully, is what I do for work. And I, I want to just say that you, <laughs> I mean, people in, in the chat room are just saying, you know, I mean, props to you. And please look into oh. Roswell next. Oh, jeez. I've had enough. <laughs> I think a lot of y'all are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, where will we? That right. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go back to this Google Drive. I uh, let's see what this is. Okay, so you see these things right here, where my mouse is. Yeah, those are water, uh, water bars, basically. So my drone is hovering right here, where I'm circling my mouse. And what happens is they're, they look like a speed bump, but they go horizontal across the road. So I, this one's going to come like that, and it's going to channel water off of the road. It's pretty ingenious, really, to keep the road looking nice. But those are, in the book, they're called thank you ma'ams because they're just bouncing. They're also, in the book, called water bars. I, I want to be really clear. Those are only on Highway 300, Rim Road right here. 
those are not on the self-made logging roads. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna, the loggers aren't gonna make those. These are put out by the forest service. Anyhow, let's see. I think this is just B-roll of, of me. This is the this is the road where you turn to get up to the uh, abduction site. Yeah, I think it's just B-roll of me turning. Get up there. All right. Okay, this is the actual old logging road that they. That this leads right to the abduction site. Let's play this, and I'm going to pause it and make it full screen. Let's wait for my truck to get out of the way here. Also, Ryan, if you get a chance, can you yeah. possibly pull up that simulation that I created just so people can see what it looks like? You're assuming that I have that saved in my Google Drive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I do. I might. I don't think so. If I do, then absolutely, I'll look for it. Anyhow, this is the old old logging road. You can see the old ruts in the road there. Um, this is a, my Ford truck. This is a full size Super Duty. You can see that it's barely fitting through here. But this is new growth. I I would argue that I don't know that my truck is any wider than this truck that they would have had back then. I don't think. Right. But regardless, you can see that. If you go flying down this road, like some of the people want to believe, you're going to crash. This is like an obstacle course of trees and rocks, and good luck. Yeah. Right? Like, again, before people come to a, th a theory and want to go on the internet posting about how they're so right, why don't you go to the site first? You just end up looking like an idiot. I agree. Anyhow, that's the road. There's no way somebody's driving 20, 30, whatever, bouncing down. No. Well, maybe the bouncing down part. All right, that's the same shot, just without the graphics. I want to just same say shot. that people in, in chat are like from all over the world, and I want to thank, say thank you for hanging in there. I've said, oh. you know, I mean, I've heard uh, Lou B was like, let's get some caffeine, and Steve is saying that I'll it's look at three thirty in the morning. And so, I mean, but it's like it's it's cool. Oh. So thanks for hanging in here with us, oh, guys. Yeah, thanks, we appreciate guys. it. Um. This is Travis Walton's first interview that he ever did. Uh, well, we can pass. It's just audio. Let's see what's this? Okay, so this was uh, this is the bottom of Gentry. That these I don't know what this building here is. It looks like it has a door that goes in there, so I don't have any idea. This is a uh, like a danger sign for uh, electricity and stuff. I I know that this is you put up pretty recently this is all modern equipment i think that everybody's seeing this would agree with me it's a shed there's a generator here i steve pierce does talk about um uh oh so i had a i had a friend that was coming to visit me before we had this planned can you guys give me like three minutes i just see him pulling up sure is that okay uh, yeah hold on Absolutely. Okay, so let's just um, let's just decompress, Scott, because holy cow, I think this is this is the longest interview that I've ever done. Well, um, I tell you what, I didn't we think it yeah would turn into this, but no, but you know what though, I I can't think of a better way to spend my Friday night. You know, hanging with my friends, talking about stuff that I actually love looking at. We both do. And so I want to say, first of all, Scott, thank you. Thanks for arranging this. And I want to say uh, there's a, a really uh, great person here, Charlie, who is in Australia, who did a lot of work. And so we would definitely love to post her website um, as well, which we will do in, in chat. Scott, if you could do that, that would be great. But yeah, it, It's a fantastic website she put together. And I went through the whole thing and read the entire thing. So it's uh pretty amazing yeah that's great and, and thank you charlie thanks for being here again and i will be reaching out to you and i again thank you everybody for for hanging with us wow this is an adventure and 
On a side note, if you uh, go to ufoclassified.com and show your support for the show, uh, then we'll be able to do a lot. We'll be able to do some really cool things, including what my passion is, which is archiving and preserving history. And as I progress and learn how to, you know, move forward into this visual medium, I'll be taking you on a tour of my my archives here. And you can see in the background, um, this is just there's a picture of Anne Ruffle up there, and this back here, these bookshelves were bookshelves that I took from Anne Ruffle's home, and her husband made them. And so this is where the, these bookshelves were in her beautiful uh, kind of a, an area where she did a lot of her research and she could look out into the, the forest and it was just, it was so amazing. And I will repost the show that I did with Alice Druffel and Druffel's daughter so you can hear that and, and also I'll post some pictures of when I was sitting there. So, you know, I've got all of these things and you can't see a lot of this over here, but I've got a complete, uh, complete collection of Fate magazine. I have periodicals from all over the world. I have more books, uh, historical books. In fact, I've got John Keel up there, Operation Trojan Horse, uh, Donald Kehoe, all of these incredible things. So this is really, really, really a freaking, it, it is a treat, and I want to show this with you. I can't wait for all of you to see this. And then also as I begin to archive, well, which I'm doing, and Ruffles research, this is also going to be very important for all of us. So I appreciate your support and your back, Ryan. So awesome. But he's still, he's, uh, he's working on the unmute. Oh, whoop, sweet. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. Let me get you back on my, my headset here. Okay, we good? Yep. You yep. can hear me? Sorry about that. I'm sorry for everybody watching. I, I like to be as professional as I can, but I'm already in a hoodie and a hat anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we left off here. I, where I was trying to go with that is Steve Pierce mentions uh, the sound of a generator. It sounds like a generator with this UFO. It's right there, just as a side note. That's right at the base of Gentry. I think this is more B-roll footage of just driving oh, yeah. down the, the logging road. Oh, let me turn off the volume here. So again, this is Rim Road right here. I think everybody would agree with me. That's a really nice road for off-road. And you, when I say you can drive 50 through that, I think most people would agree with me. This yeah. is the turn off to, to the uh, site, we'll call it. This is, look at the huge difference in road quality there. Oh yeah, for sure. So this is this right. You can see my my truck. This is four wheel drive, but you see it kind of teeter totter, and it's not it. It's I, I don't know how fast I'm driving. People can come to their own conclusion, but I wouldn't say I'm going any more than five or six miles an hour. Right. <clears throat> so that's this is what it looks like going to the site. I'm gonna go here and look at the car. Are you guys interested in this? Seeing how everything looks going out there. Would I it be totally cool if you guys I think of, it's absolutely I think I don't it's want fascinating. To, you guys can see I'm sitting here looking at the comments and I don't see anything. No? Boring you guys to death, huh? No, no, <laughs> I'm I'm in <laughs> shock right. and awe, baby. This is uh, yeah, I'm just kinda I'm shell uh, this for people that are interested i'd be happy to put this google drive link out there this is like a 400 page document of everything dealing with this case from every interview every newspaper article every police report every everything if anybody's interested I, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just send this i'll send it to scott and you guys can put it on your website if you want Fantastic. but i uh, yeah i mean here's the initial description 15 by 8. For the record, Gentry is 14 by 8. 
Wow. So, I mean, you can, yeah. I, uh, let's get past that. All right. So, this here, this is a, a photograph of uh, one of the uh, sites that allegedly has a tree ring growth. I just took this with my iPhone. I have a lot of other shots of this, but um, Mike Rogers cut this out, not National Geographic or, or anybody else. This is, or some, I don't know, UFO, UFO group, the police, Area 51 people. I don't know. Mike Rogers cut this out. All right. This is another tree sample here. Uh, I know that probably none of us in here are true ring experts, but I, I've got a pretty close up shot of it. Uh, this is the actual site from the ground. The UFO was allegedly right, right here where my mouse is circling. Just in case. I, here's another shot of so these old trees. If you look at it, and again, like none of us here are tree experts, but you'll see there's no abnormal growth to this thing. It's not growing oblong or anything like they try to point out in the, in the movie, in a documentary. It's just a normal tree. I think there's a, I could have swore there was a a slice of a tree that was in track. I have that. I yeah. have that too. It's it'll be in here somewhere. This stuff is not in order, as you guys can tell. But I mean, uh, it, but it wasn't tested by anybody with any kind of scientific background. Yeah, that's correct. So this is another CL100 series cab tower. Uh, you can see this is how the lights would go. There would be a lens that go right over the top of that. Right. Um, but that's how the lights look. In case you all are wondering. Cool. Well, that's all right. And, and I just want to ask, because this is a really great uh, question uh, here from Steve yeah. Wills, who was saying the area looks yeah. quite sparse in terms of the forest. Would the area uh, have been dense in, with trees in 75? No. And but here, let's go back to this aerial shot. Let's go back to some of these aerials of that area. So you can see where the trees were cut right here, Steve. The, what their job is, is to, to cut the trees from Rim Road this direction. So their job was to get rid of the trees. Uh, so quite sparse, sparse in terms of a forest, would it have been more dense in the trees? I, I want to be clear. I'm not an expert on how trees looked in 1975. I'm not going to claim to. The only thing I can tell you is that their job, to, their contract was to cut the trees from Rim Road this direction down. If we go to this site, you can still see the remnants of that work. And just make sure we specify that this is the location where they claim that it happened. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. All right. So let's go back here to this Google Drive. And, and yes, thanks, Charlie. Charlie's in here in chat answering questions as well. So that's very cool. Yeah, she, yeah Charlie's a huge help. I was the daughter. I, all right. All right. So. Here, here is the text messages the day of the, the call. Um, again, I know y'all are going to screenshot this, so go ahead. But we're talking about Mexican food, which everybody's heard the call. Doesn't probably won't shock you. Here's oops, here's the date. These are the timestamps. I so I'm telling him I plan on calling you in about an hour. Will you be around? That's at six forty nine. 650, yes, I will. 650 back, talk to you then. 651, will do. And something like a secret to whisper in your ear, that's at 651. Shortly thereafter, he calls me and you you guys have heard the recording from there. So this is this part right here. If, if, what's the secret if it's not what you all heard? Right. I'm all the way back. Oh, All right, so this is, uh, so I had mentioned this earlier to you guys. If we're going to go out to the site, then let's go on Monday. Oops. Given how many people were there last, sorry, were there last weekend, we cannot risk anyone overhearing what we are talking, what we're discussing. Well, who cares if we're talking about the story as told, right? 
why would I say that? And he's saying, I agree. And then he, he's calm at changing the subject, but I must keep my actual address a secret. I, he didn't want me to know where, where he lived and we met instead. Here, Saturday, May 1st, we had already gone to dinner and we had left. He's asking me for ibuprofen. Fine, here's the next morning. Okay, right, I'm up now, it's almost five. My leg is terribly sore, I can barely walk. Uh, also, one reason I can't be found is my genius son's fixed the records. Well, I'm not gonna go into that. I don't know how, but he, okay, fine. All except for being very slow, I seriously enjoyed the day in your company. Let, let's let's talk about this for a second. I am, I am a pitch as a groupie. I am pitched as somebody that came out of nowhere. Do you really think somebody would like Mike or anybody else would go out with me to the middle of the, the middle of nowhere? Would we be having conversations like this? Right. Where critical thinking comes into play. That doesn't really happen here, but thank you for pointing that out. Critical thinking. <laughs> <laughs> here is the first Facebook message I had, which you guys have already affirmed, where we're talking about film production, film crews, and of course there's pictures of Gentry. I I, it's also really important to recognize we're not friends on Facebook. I think he likes to say that I'm his friend. But, okay. uh, this is the mural that we were talking about. Nobody knows who painted it. Uh, that's what it looks like. This is what a CL100 series tower looks like at night. Now, this is not Gentry, to be clear, but it is the same model. I imagine this being covered in trees, hobbling around the tree line. I don't know that anybody could disagree that that looks exactly like a UFO. What are you saying? Are these trans transcript slides accessible to the public? No. I don't know what that means. Do you guys? He, he just wants to know if these images are accessible to the public. Oh. I already, it's in the video, I guess. This is all being recorded. This is another CL100 series tower at night. You can see how it just totally illuminates the area. This is not Gentry, to be clear. I don't even know where this is, but that is a CL100 series tower. I'm um, not the end. I think that is the end. Um, yeah, so yeah, I really would like yeah. to get that, that simulation up there. Okay. Um, let me... Um, let's I don't want you to email it to me or text it to me. Actually, just text it to me. It will show up right here at the top of my screen, and I'll just click on your text really quick. All right. And next week, Scott, you and I are going to get on the graphics mojo with StreamYard. This has been a learning experience. <laughs> oh, sorry. Your phone number just was on there. Okay. You you can go ahead and talk about that. Why you do that, I'm going to get up and get a glass of water. Okay. Yeah. So after everything, I just took the time to take one of these fire towers, kind of throw some trees in front of it. Um, you know, and of course, like Ryan talks about a lot of these fire towers, especially back then they had lenses that they used for, that were colored, that they used for different things to give off different signals. So some of them had blue beams and red beams and green. So I threw a bunch of trees in front of this one that was the original photo is exposed and it shows the stilts but I wanted to kind of give an idea of what these guys may have seen. That's beautiful. And as always, your graphics are stunning. It's kind of what I saw uh, from his images that he was showing me, but, you know, not being there at night with it lit up through the trees. And I kind of wanted to show people how that may have looked when they saw it. Wow. Good job, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, that takes care of this. I, Charlie, I should not going to care. We're going to pull up her website really quick. I, okay. Charlie, I don't know why you're here. And again, I just want to, while you're pulling that up, I just want to say thank you, all of you. I mean, I'm seeing new faces uh, in the show, and I was obviously doing a podcast radio show. Wham! Holy huh? baby, George what? Michael. Okay. Sorry, that uh, I just I got distracted. Wake me up. You have a crush Lego, on George right Michael. There. You know what? I kind of. All right, so here's Charlie's side. <laughs> um. Sorry, Charlie, that you can't. That sounds funny. Sorry, Charlie. Uh, but, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not here, but she has really done a great job, you guys. She really has. I'm going to go to her main point. She has it all organized here. Um, here's Mike's confession to me. Here's here's the slide that was used on, on my audio. Um, here is, oh, that's a quote by Robert Schaefer. Here's a quote, a quote by Mike Rogers to Paranormal Pop that Ryan Gordon claimed in the future he's going to be working with Robert Schaefer and they're going to put together a documentary about all of this. Travis told me a lot of this. This is confirmation of me. I'm just not some guy coming off the street like he likes to say. Uh, more pictures of how the towers are, are lit up. Um, built in 1965, the 70 foot gentry towers, 14 by 14. Um, they work on five day shifts. Um, sorry, try just going through this fairly quickly to respect these folks time. Here are actual quotes from like, here's Steve Pierce in 2013 with Michael Vara, whoever that is. The, the thing is beautiful. It was a solid white and you could see the window frames coming down from it. And then there was a frame in the middle of it. It was like two cake pans on top of each other, glowing white. Well, what do y'all think? Yeah. Here's a quote by Mike Rogers. Now, again, he this story has changed since tonight, which is unfortunate. But it was more or less a white, sort of golden white. And that was just the panels because it had a framework. The bottom of it was reflective, looked like metal underneath. But they are, the whole thing up, metal. It was all made of metal and covered in shiny, clean glass. It was glowing. It was actually lighting up the ground around there, but softly. I mean, you guys. Yeah. Yep. I. Uh, here's my my shot here. I. Uh, here here is Charlie pointing to it. Um. I want you guys, if you're interested in in this to really go spend time on her on her website i uh, she has her own maps here she talks you heard mike tonight talk about a clearing where they would stop and blah 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 that clearing is right in front of gentry like right there yep i okay. uh, she goes back and forth and she's yeah, again yeah, done such a, great, a good job yeah it's a, on this. It's, a it's a great website i Here's where they're talking about they, they worked late. Um, this is also really interesting. So S. Pierce, that's Steve Pierce. Okay, let me tell you something. And let me get a source for this. This and other experts are transcripts from two 1978 interviews with Philip Class, with whom Steve was cooperating at the time. P.K. Philip Class placed what he considered important speech in all caps. Okay, so let me tell you something. It was in his book, T.W., Travis Walton. It says in the book that they worked halt hard all day you know travis didn't do one thing all day he stayed in the truck he stayed in the truck all day he was sick he was supposed to be sick well travis was in the travis was in the car that day and mike was gone that day mike said he wasn't gone that was a lie did anyone ask him where he'd gone pk philip class yeah but he said he was down the mountain working so basically what's happening here per per steve pierce is these guys the day of this this event they're off doing their own thing you can use your imagination what they're doing uh, yeah here's 
Mike. Um, here is Charlie uh, showing a Google Images thing with uh, Turkey Springs. Here's that old Verde Road that I guys showed you on the aerial footage. So when you look at this, you could see how somebody like Robert Lee could say, oh, well, that's the way they, they would go home. What you can't tell in this photo is that huge canyon. Like, I think anybody would agree with me. You couldn't get across there if you tried. This is the problem with using satellite imagery. Right. Um, so, again, she, I'm not doing justice to Charlie's site. And, Charlie, don't call me after this and try to shoot me. But, no, it's very uh, deep. <laughs> It's I'm not doing enough justice. She has done such a, a tremendous job here. Like, uh, and, yeah. and her website uh, is three dollar kit. That's correct. Yeah, three dollar right. kit. That we um, dot com. I think she has just three dollar kit dot com okay, now. Okay. Okay. Yep. Anyhow, tons of tons of stuff on here. Rather than just me continue to sit here and listen to a, a, a speech that I don't know that I signed up for, does anybody have any questions? No. I don't think any of us signed up for this. I just <laughs> want to say, but I mean, uh, I gotta know. pretty much power out pretty soon anyway. Wow. Yeah. No. I think I think I'm going to. I mean, this has been this whole day. The, I think the past 24 hours have been, it's been huh. pretty mind blowing. For me, and, and yeah. just to go through this whole process, and, and again to just get uh, to be shown different inf facts, information as it's coming in, and then to try to process things is always interesting. And so, Ryan, I appreciate your willingness to a you know to first to reach out uh, to us to talk about this, like you had mentioned, you know your your reputation you know was called into question uh because you had allegedly doctored this uh right. conversation and in things and i i think that it, you know it's it's just important you know and i will say again i i am i would love to hear from from anybody else that is involved in this to give me a counter perspective on things i mean let's have a dialogue here is this information let's let's hear from all sides involved um but this is this is these are some bombshells um and so uh, a question from peter in chat is why why has the tower theory not come out before now i don't know because most people I, I don't think anybody about most, sight. yeah yeah um so shadowy spectrums. Why haven't you looked around on Google Maps to see the tower yourself, respectfully? I don't mean that in an offensive way, but I. Why haven't you looked yourself? It. it I mean, and I. I love. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, and I think he's asking a very. It's not. I don't. I know him. He's been on my show, and I don't think it's an, an offensive question i think oh, he's you know what i mean i all. think it's asking like okay this is yeah so why hasn't this come out and i think i don't you know, i don't know i don't know how to answer that no but i think that this is you know and you ryan when we were talking it, it's you know i i will say i'm not the first person who has looked in at in depth in, at this case because there's so many places to go there's so many things that i've learned and then i follow a rabbit hole and go down and learn things that i'm particularly interested in and then but if anybody actually spent the time doing the kind of investigation that you've done uh, then maybe we could come to a better resolution because yeah. most of us just get on online or we get on YouTube and we're looking at the bright shiny carrot and then we're going to be yeah. told by Lou Elizondo or you know all of these these people that are presenting a nice little wrapped up right. narrative that this is where we should go. And at the end of the day, it's like get off your, you know, and and do some research, ask people questions, hold people accountable for making up narratives, hold people accountable yeah. for saying that I work for you know the Department of Defense and I'm this elite trainer and I'm doing you know A B C and D but yet when you get exposed you know you're still you have this fan club that is supporting you and I mean it's just like give me a break I mean th this people in this subject need to get a freaking clue 
I, you deserve I, this. Yeah. We deserve better I, than this. I just so want to say you. what Charlie says, and I and I agree with her completely, is that the tower was too far away from the location that they claimed the abduction was at. So if it was so far away from there, then nobody's going to make that connection because those two locations are so far from each other. And I think, yeah. I think Ryan seeing it, having the impression that he was seeing a UFO and he realized exactly what this was all about. I think that's what happened. Well, I'll tell yeah. you. I mean, I'm but not I mean, sure. But I mean, nobody ever looked at the tower because the claimed abduction site was so far away from that tower that nobody would have put those two pieces together. I also would like to know how how many researchers, either pro or con this story, have gone to the site. Yeah, that's that's another good question. Or or how many people and this is the thing that I always, you know, with my research about certain topics I obsess about yeah. continually. It's like how many people have just gone beyond believing what a specific person is is saying. It's like, oh no, this this person is great. He's a pillar of the community or he is doing A, B, right. C and D and we would never question him. He is a, a God fearing right. man. And it's like Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good luck to you. I guess that's why the world's yeah. kind of going down in a handbasket, but you probably might want to ask some questions about things in, in this field especially. We should know better. This is the Wild West. How do we not how do we not expect to ask why shouldn't we be asking questions? And why should Correct. people that we ask questions of, you know, sh you run away and say oh no 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 you know it's the government you're from the the dark cabal you're an agent sent to discredit yeah. us i mean come on right. give me a break but i i really feel strongly that this is going to be a pivotal show clearly and um and i think that we're do we're going to do good things and this is important so i ryan thank you for, for coming yeah. forward, you weren't going to do this, uh, you know, earlier in the day, and I, I want to thank Mike as well. I think I've still, um, I've still. Do you say I didn't want to do it? Well, I, I think that you were, you were a little guarded. You, you, you said you would do it, but I think there was a point to which you would go. And I think. I think I've were, maintained those. I think I've kept myself in that box. I hope I have. <laughs> I hope. Well, you've, you've been. I, I want to make clear to everybody again: this is nothing but a theory. I'm going to keep saying that. People are welcome to interpret that any way they want, but it's a theory. That's all. Well, I appreciate it because I, it yeah. is, I mean, this is, I've been. Incredible. Here's those four questions here on Charlie's site. I mean, seriously, you guys, have, this is not some claim to fame of some magical polygraph, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's nothing here that's all that cool. I don't think. No. I am. Anyhow, I'm going to wrap up. I've got my, my company here. Again, oh, cool. we weren't expecting anybody to, to come. But is there any other question? No, I'm Oh, good. thank you, Shadowy Spectrum. I, and I appreciate you putting in writing that to theory. Um, it has been. It's been coming on 46 years. Um, yeah, and I, I appreciate the compliment. I, I think that people should go here and and check this out and uh, I appreciate the support and getting rid of all these accusations that I manipulated some phone call I saw somebody else ask hours ago how many does does Ryan have more information or more calls everything I have with these guys is recorded every everything is is I have hours and hours with with Mike and, and others so um, I, I don't have any intent to release that. It's not my. It's not what I'm here for to, to on some kind of smear campaign. So so I mean, Ryan, what at the end of the day after this interview, what do you think people will do in in a reaction to this? What do you predict happening? Um, I predict that they're going to say that I'm crazy. I wouldn't be surprised if they say that I'm like the rebirth of Philip Class, some weird CIA disinformation agent. 
I wouldn't be surprised if they if I'm half alien myself or uh, <laughs> you're on the dark cabal uh, with me. Sweet. That's right. Yeah. Um I went through a portal at Skinwalker Ranch and here I am. Well, I've heard that um, story before. I, I I think it will just be to discredit me. That's already happened. I'm a I'm a nobody. I don't do this. I hope I've made a good enough impression with with everybody tonight that that's what the allegations against me are not accurate. Um, Absolutely. And if people think that I'm some kind of weirdo, well, that's I guess okay too. Uh, well, I think that you are a weirdo who actually has done your homework, and and I'm, I mean, thank you. This yeah, is incredible, absolutely. incredible, absolutely. incredible. And so, where can people find you and connect with you? I've you never. Kind of... Yeah, I see that. I see that here. I've never been in a position where I've done anything like this for a show, like this. I've never given public interviews on shows that I've done in the past. Wow. I. Um, the only reason I'm here is because of the allegations made against me. My my reputation means a lot to me. Um, I I think that um, I don't know how to answer that question because I am not set up for anybody to contact me. Okay, great. If you have any, I, uh, uh, Erica and Scott, they have my contact information. If you want to send them something, I I'm. Maybe we'll meet again in a month or so and go over some more questions, perhaps. I don't thank know. You. That's up to them. It's their show. Thank you. But, Absolutely. I would love uh, to have you back and thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got, let's, let's say five more minutes and then I want to go spend time with my company. No, but absolutely. I mean, I think the, if anybody you. has any, any last questions they'd like to ask, this was a, we're on a four hours now for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm working I on many levels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't think I've ever been on a four-hour podcast. That I've never done one, and and I yeah, like I said, I think this is going to be a lot for us to digest. And and granted, I'm sure people will be picking this apart and bring it on. So yeah. that's yeah. all I can say. Yeah, You've okay. done incredible. I don't. I don't want me. Don't believe me. Just believe that the evidence. I don't. I'm not here to sell anything or have anybody believe me. I don't know that I really want a bunch of UFO fans. Right. And you and you've always went with the fact that it's your theory. That's correct. You know, uh, and I would appreciate it in the in the title of the video that if you do say anything dealing with this, I would appreciate from a production side if you guys always promote this as just a theory because that's all it is. Right. Yeah, cool. I think all of this is just a theory and I think that's an important yeah, thing. Right. But thank you, yeah. Ryan. I hope you have an incredible evening. Go relax and chill, and I'll be touching base with you. And what a whirlwind! But I'm happy to get to know you. Yeah, it was it was nice to meet you as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Any any questions here? I think Charlie. everybody's in shock and on. Charlie just said, "Yeah, thanks for talking to Ryan, and hopefully I can get yeah. Charlie on the show." And uh, yeah, wow. I'm I'm in shock. Yeah. Oh, there's Victor. I've talked to Victor before. Victor would make a great reporter. Well, I need he to. Likes to. He likes to ask questions. Well, that's good. Anyhow. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess we'll wrap up. Nice to meet you guys. All right. Good. Nice um, to meet you. You too. Yep. And, and thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I just, what a, what a night. Ryan, take care. Have fun with your friends. And yeah. I will catch you guys next week. I don't know if we can top this, but we'll give it a try. But <laughs> <All right. laughs> Ryan, I'll, I'll bring you Take back. So thanks, right. you guys. Yeah. Take care. Right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.